Welcome to Microsoft's Tech Day series. Today's live event covers modernizing your ops with Azure and Visual Studio Code, and will be of particular interest to Java developers. Our presenters today are Microsoft's Rory Preddy and Martin Verberg. Over the next two and a half hours, we'll bring you technical demos from Rory and Martin, and you'll have a chance to ask your own questions along the way. Before the show begins today, we'd like to talk to you about code of conduct and accessibility. First of all, code of conduct. We ask all participants, whether appearing live or participating in the interactive chat, to be aware of others, welcoming and respectful, understanding of differences, friendly and patient, open to all questions and viewpoints, and to be kind and considerate to others. If you have any concerns about anything you hear or see today, please email buzzcond at microsoft.com. And now a word about accessibility. If you require captioning today, please watch the show via YouTube, aka dot ms forward slash tech days forward slash YouTube, where auto captioning will be available. Alternatively, the show will be available on demand at aka dot ms forward slash tech days forward slash Java with full captioning available. All of today's links and resources are available at aka dot ms forward slash tech days forward slash Java dash resources. Now don't forget that we have live chat throughout today's show. We have a small team of moderators answering questions and it will also feature your top questions on air. And now without further ado, let's introduce our presenters, Rory Preddy and Martin Verberg. Thank you so much, Adam. Yeah, I'm so, so excited to be here. Um, you know, I've, I've never actually visited UK and uh, Adam promised me now if I do a really good job in this, uh, he'll invite me uh, there though. So let me tell you a little bit about me and then I'll, I'll hand over to Martin. So I, I'm calling from uh, Johannesburg, <laughs> calling like we still do uh, calls, um, in uh, South Africa. Um, and uh, I am a 42 year old male. I've got brown hair, I've got earphones on and um, I'm wearing a black uh, shirt and I've got two plants there, which I'm, I'm really managing to keep alive. It's, it's like my little hobby here. And I uh, work for Microsoft as a developer advocate for Java and for accessibility. And I'm here with a, a really incredible uh, human being and a team uh, that is going to put on a great show with you. And uh, uh, Martin over there, uh, over to you, Martin, tell me a little bit about yourself. Hi everyone, uh, my name is uh, Martin or Martin if you're using the, the, the Dutch version. Um, I'm a 43 year old male. Uh, I'd like to say my hair is brown, but the reality is it's now white and gray. Uh, I'm wearing headphones and behind me I've got some art and things. Uh, the office is, is my bedroom as it is for many of you under lockdown. Um, I run the Java engineering group here uh, for Microsoft globally. Uh, so we do things like provide our own build of OpenJDK or Java itself. And we work on tooling and services on Azure uh, for Java developers to make your lives uh, easier. I also run the London Java user group. Um, so I'm pretty familiar, hopefully, with some of you who are watching today. Um, so nice to see you all. And yeah, happy to be here. And it's kind of a strange time, Microsoft and Java. Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, I, my first qualification I got was a Microsoft certified system engineer. And then I became a Java developer and I actually worked for one of the competitor cloud products. And then uh, I found out that Microsoft had a developer advocacy for Java. And uh, through hook and crook, I, I started joining there. And one of the things I really battled to understand with developers is how to modernize your applications. It's, it's actually one of the topics that we're doing here. Uh, but the uh, developers have fed back to us and they said, uh, it's great you show us Kubernetes. <laughs> Go straight to Kubernetes and show us how to uh, uh, and do a multi-tiered uh, cluster. But what we're going to show you today, we're going to start off from the beginning and uh, with absolutely nothing, and then we're going to take you through the different levels. Um, and so myself and Martin have paired off into this nice little team. Uh, Martin is going to be the the stern and strong architect type who uh, really kind of like knows everything. And Rory's going to be like the developer uh, dude who just kind of does everything on the side there and, and, and does the implementation. And we can hopefully bring you through to the realization that it's such a rich ecosystem uh, at Microsoft uh, for Java via the different and three presentations that we've got. So the first presentation we've got is getting started with Visual Studio Code. We're gonna take you from zero to hero on, on how you can use Java with that. 
The second one is that we're going to show you app service. The, the incredible pair service that we have there and how to ut uh, utilize it with all of its uh, nice features. And then the, the final uh, section that we have is Azure Spring Cloud. Because friends don't let friends Kubernetes. But what we've taken is we've taken the best portions of Kubernetes and then uh, uh, added some Azure flavor to it with order scaling and distributed tracing and uh, you know the, the features that really make uh, the cloud uh, uh, powerful and giving you the power to scale up. We've got uh, customers like Kroger who run 3,000 stores in Azure Spring Cloud. But we're going to take you from uh, uh, getting started with Visual Studio Code all the way through to app services and then Azure Spring Cloud. Um, so, yeah, Martin, what should the, 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 the people who are listening really come out of the session with? What do you feel that they'll get uh, out of this? Uh, I'd, love, I'd like to think they'll get two things. One is that um, please do ask us any questions at any time throughout the next two hours. Um, you know, between Rory and I, we can answer just about anything with regards to Microsoft and its direction with Java and, and where we see it going. We, we, you know, Microsoft fully believes that modern Java and modernization Java is, is definitely the way forward. Um, and I think the other thing I hope folks get out of this is uh, really how easy it is uh, to actually deploy your Java applications from end-to-end -end, uh, using something like Visual Studio Code all the way through to, a, to an app service. So that pain of having to do DevOps work as a Java engineer, which I know many of you uh, love. Uh, I used to joke that Kubernetes was a Klingon, was a Klingon rude word. Um, you don't have to do you have to go through that pain anymore. You don't have to learn the Kuba CTL command line, et cetera. It's all taken care of for you. Thanks, Martin. Okay, so we've got our first presentation coming up. Um, and then uh, Martin's going to hand over to me at the demo. And at the same time with the demos, uh, I'm going to go slow enough that you can actually start with your own laptop. So I'm going to show you how to do this. You can uh, download the, the tools that I show you. And then we can proceed as we, we, we progress through that and go through some of the demos. Uh, so I, I highly recommend you to get your laptops up and then uh, let's get started. Over to you, Martin. All right, thanks very much. Uh, we'll swap over to good old PowerPoint. We are Microsoft after all. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. So getting started with VS Code and Java. Now, I realize that many of you uh, Java developers in particular are probably well versed with you know, really big, robust IDEs like Eclipse, uh, like NetBeans, and of course, JetBrains is uh, IntelliJ. Um, in recent years, VS Code has actually become incredibly popular with both Java developers and in particular, full stack developers who are doing things like building microservices and having to deal with not only Java code, but actually building the front end at the same time with say JavaScript, TypeScript, uh, React, uh, whatever else might, might go on. So VS Code for me is actually now my go-to editor for Java programs, which, which sounds quite strange, but these days I'm now building these modern microservices full mm -hmm. stack. Um, and so what I want is a lightweight code editor that's fully integrated with GitHub, fully integrated with Azure, and lets me go all the way through. So here's all the kind of steps that Rory's going to take you through in the demo. I'll uh, kind of discuss some of these points as uh, we go through in the slide deck. Um, but as you can see, there's a whole bunch of stuff that VS Code is capable of doing with your Java applications. Uh, everything from, you know, setting up our build of OpenJDK, which we're particularly proud of, all the way through to deploying to Azure and doing some of that log streaming and tracing and things that, uh, that you just need to do when you're running a production system. So I shall continue on. Um, actually, I'll pause there for a second. I believe there is a poll running in the background, kind of helping us understand where you are coming from, uh, whether you might be a Java developer or perhaps a .NET developer who's curious about Java, or you've just popped along because you're wondering, Microsoft and Java, what on earth is going on? So, so Martin and I, and we'll adjust accordingly. Martin and I actually spoke about this, and uh, you know, um, we we I'm actually part of the uh, the App Dev uh, uh, Advocate team, and we work closely with the .NET uh, Advocate team. Though um, there are so many similarities around that, that uh, Martin and I said a lot of the times, whatever you're going to see here, it works across the board with uh, .NET, Java, Go, Python. So if you're watching and you're a Go developer or a .NET developer, uh, this definitely is the session for you because it's really, really uh, kind of uh, 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 similar to your ecosystem. 
Uh, absolutely. And the, the running joke, of course, is that C Sharp and Java are so similar syntactically these days that as long as you put the capital I for interface on the front of your interface classes for, for .NET, you just take that away for Java. And, you know, we have camel case in Java and you capitalize everything in .NET. Apart from that, you can read both sets of code. So it won't be a problem for you to follow along. We are um, still waiting for proper generics. I'll, I'll give you that. And that will be a great day indeed. Uh, it will be a great day. And uh, th that's a conversation to have with uh, all of you in Q&A, actually, of, of why Java doesn't have fully realized generics and how hard it would actually be to edit it. It's a fun conversation. Um, on the slide right now, there's a whole bunch of links for you. But the big uh, hero action item there on the right is the one you want to go for. If you just go to aka.ms forward slash coding hyphen pack, uh, that's where you want to go. And that'll help you install Visual Studio Code and the Java extensions for that. Uh, Rory's going to take you through that in the demo after this, but if you are following along on your laptop or at home, uh, please do follow that link. All righty. Uh, to get started, so Visual Studio Code has this concept of uh, both workspaces uh, and, and, and folders, effectively. Uh, but the easiest way to start is just to simply use the file and open folders uh, uh, menu item. And uh, Visual Studio Code with the Java language extension pack installed is very clever. It automatically will pick up things like, oh, you've got a Maven build or a Gradle build, or you clearly have Java code here. So I'm going to figure out what the class path is underneath the hood and things. Um, so it's going to figure all that stuff out for you. And you'll see it do a whole bunch of work up front. Um, you can figure out that it's done uh, by just looking at the build status uh, icon on the status bar, which will be uh, at the bottom of Visual Studio Code. Uh, there are accessibility options built into Visual Studio Code as well. So if you need uh, voice assistance, et cetera, to tell you that something is complete, I believe that is, uh, that is all possible. A new feature uh, that everyone should be aware of is this idea of workspace trust. Now, we're all engineers. We all love to tinker with new open source projects or little cool things we find out there on the internet. And, and that's fine and good. But the reality is not all of that is trustworthy anymore. And if you want to make sure and secure both your own machine and secure the supply chain of your, your company and, and your production systems, uh, we've added a nice feature called Workspace Trust. And what it does is it runs Visual Studio Code in a reduced uh, capability mode. So it won't allow things like you know going and writing to your file system or executing the debugger so it can write to your CPU and things. Um, but you can still like browse the source code and have a good look around and, and things uh, if it's something you don't trust fully. All right, on to the next bit. Go on, PowerPoint, you can do it. Here we go. Awesome. So uh, good old Project Explorer. Um, you can see it highlighted there. Uh, Rory, again, will show this to you uh, in a bit more depth in a live demo. Uh, so I won't belabor this one too long, uh, but you can see how it's split up on the left. Now, interestingly, when you're using Visual Studio Code as a Java developer, you'll see there, for example, that you've got the Java project there, which is currently highlighted. You'll also see below there um, this thing called Outline and then another one below that called Maven. So your entire project is kind of split into these useful um, components, I guess. Uh, where if you need to do things like configure the Maven or execute a particular Maven build cycle, as an example, you, you can jump do, jump to that section. Um, there's a Spring Boot dashboard. So if you're doing anything that's particularly Spring Boot specific, as an example, you can go and do that. Or you can just look at your Java source code under this, this project view. Um, so your overall project, remember, is split into these different sections. So if you find yourself, oh, I need to find where that Maven build thing is, just go look at the little Maven section there. All righty, on to the next one. Uh, you can, of course, inspect code, just like any other powerful Java IDE today. So you can jump to the type definitions. You can go to the implementation if you're in an interface. Very importantly, we are an OO language after all. You can show that type hierarchy and that call hierarchy uh, just to see how uh, horrifically computer science pro you've gone in your uh, software design. Um, and again, Rory will demonstrate that later on and actually show you some of the, uh, the graphing uh, capabilities there. Uh, auto completion. Um, back in the old days, when we used to just use text editors or Vi or Notepad to uh, do our coding, uh, we had to touch type all of our code. And woe betide if you got any of that wrong. Uh, you'd have to go back and, and edit all the bits and pieces. 
and there was no help, right? So you'd have to print out for .NET, you'd print out the, uh, the Microsoft docs, or for Java, you'd print out the Java doc of the API, you'd have it on your desk next to you uh, to figure out what API calls you can make. Um, these days, of course, uh, the IDE does a lot of that for you, and Visual Studio Code is no different. Uh, it uses a, a Java language server that we collaborate on with partners at the Eclipse Foundation. And you can use the old, uh, I think it's control space, uh, I believe, on, on both Mac and uh, Windows. And it'll help you auto-complete and give you uh, ideas of uh, what options are available to you to code next. How much uh, control space style programming do you do these days, Rory? Or are you still a touch typist pro? I have nightmares, literally, because I did everything uh, of TextPad. So if you don't know TextPad, it's like Notepad++. Plus plus, And I did everything. Now, I wrote my degree uh, with pencil and paper. So I did an entire hierarchy, like animal, cat, dog, uh, go and make it bark uh, with pencil. And I remember coming to the end of my, my, my Notepad, there was no more paper, and I had to close the indentation. And I still have nightmares with that. And I had to go bracket, 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 all the way through to that. So I'm looking at these RDEs, and I'm going... This is this is what they did. The 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 the, the chosen uh, uh, time of of humanity. We've got so much uh, uh, spoiled for this, though. But it, it is a really great time to be a Java developer. Absolutely. Uh, you can also see from these screenshots on the slides that uh, Visual Studio Code does, of course, support dark mode for you night owls. All right. Uh, refactoring. Uh, refactoring is pretty critical. We all know that uh, end users and customers have the absolute right to change their minds of their business requirements, and that often requires uh, some refactoring of code. Or perhaps you've had a discussion about naming with your uh, fellow developers uh, around a whiteboard in person or, or virtual, and uh, you found out that that name was wrong, and you've got to go rename that, that thing across all of your code. So. Visual Studio Code supports all of that. You've got a whole bunch of very powerful refactoring capabilities. Um, certainly beats hand editing each, each file in hand. Code generation, of course, very, very important. We all know that Java um, still does have a, a bit of boilerplate to it. Um, and so things like generating your getters and setters, because Java doesn't have properties yet, we're very sorry. Um, and things like you know, the hash code and equals, which is really critical if you're going to build a comparable uh, interface or a comparable functionality for your domain objects. All that stuff can be generated for you by uh, Visual Studio Code. So you don't have to type all that boilerplate yourself. You just go get the IDE to do it for you. All right. Um, of course, you want your IDE to help you with any problems and errors and warnings. Um, so all of the common compiler warning warnings that comes out of Javac plus some extra um, intelligence that we've got with the Java language extension uh, is all made available to you in the problems view. Um, and you can right click on those um, or select those and uh, ask it to give you a quick fix. So give you a whole bunch of options. Um, so again, Visual Studio Code, despite you know being a lightweight code editor by design, is actually surprisingly powerful when it comes to a fully fledged language uh, like Java. Um, now, amusingly, um, whenever I try and even do Hello World these days, uh, even <laughs> even I still go to that problems uh, section to figure out why I got my public static void main the wrong way around. That That is because you haven't signed up Git with GitHub Code Pilot, which I'm going to show you in the demo, but it works <coughs> fine, though. So GitHub Code Pilot actually will say Hello World for you. Um, and it scanned like billions lines of code, and it, it basically knows what I'm thinking. I'm going to show you a, a little bit later in the demo uh, how Copilot works, though. And the, you, don't, you never have to even know uh, how to do system out print, uh, you know, uh, uh, that. Uh, and because a lot of RDEs, you, you have all your macros changing between going from IntelliJ to Visual Studio Code, everything changes. With Copilot, you just go, tell me what I'm supposed to do, and it just does that. So uh, stay, stay tuned for that demo. Yeah, it's it, it's it's a pretty amazing feature that GitHub have put out there, and uh, you know some some of the results are, are amusing, but a lot of the time I uh, <laughs> I have raised eyebrows with how how good it is. Um, it's it's really fantastic. Um, speaking of GitHub, I don't know if you'll have time to show this, Rory. Maybe we can squeeze it in somewhere over the next couple of hours. Um, the other powerful reason why Visual Studio Code is so good as a Java developer is that whenever you are on GitHub itself you can actually open up any Java repository you find there in GitHub in the browser 
you just hit the full stop or the period on your uh, keyboard, and it actually opens up Visual Studio Code in something called GitHub Code Spaces. So you have Visual Studio Code in the browser automatically opening up that repo for you so you can go and investigate the code. Um, and that is just, just utterly fantastic. And I've, I've been using it a lot. Well, now that you've put me on the spot, I am going to have to show that. So uh, yeah. <laughs> I think towards, towards the end, what I can do is when I show uh, GitHub uh, Actions, so uh, one of the demos we're going to do in Terraform, you show apps, app service, I'll actually open up the project in GitHub Code Spaces, make a little edit, and I'll trigger the, the GitHub uh, Actions with Code Spaces. Just remind me when we get to that thing there. And that is something uh, really pretty to watch because it's GitHub uh, actions are triggered by an in-browser uh, uh, push there. So you know, really wait for that also. Oh, that, sound, that sounds very cool. All right, on to the next little bit. Um, yep, so troubleshooting, fixing errors. So uh, Visual Studio Code uses a light bulb system on, on the left in the left-hand uh, column of the, of the editor. Uh, that's something that uh, some folks uh, may miss if they're new to Visual Studio Code, so that's why we're pointing it out here. Um, so that's where you can get your quick fixes. So when you see uh, a line which is underlined with, with red, red is bad, or there's a, some sort of a problem, uh, you just look to the left and the little light bulb will pop up for you and give you some helpful uh, potential fixes there. All right, uh, you can actually also have a full debugger in Visual Studio Code. So again, Visual Studio Code designed to be a lightweight code editor and the thing we want to get out to folks today is that you can actually do full-scale Java debugging with it. So you can see here that um, a whole bunch of breakpoints have been set. Uh, we're stepping through the call stack. And uh, you know the days of having to write system.out.println statements all throughout your code uh, should hopefully be over. Uh, you should be using this instead. All right. Uh, now, if you remember all the way at the back of this presentation, at the start of this presentation, we talked a lot about how Visual Studio Code allows you to do the code and push all the way through to, to Azure at the end. So uh, in this part here, you can see a little GitHub symbol on the left-hand side there. We have full GitHub integration inside Visual Studio Code. Uh, and you can see there, there is a pull request, I believe, by Rory sneakily there in the, in the screenshot. Um, and so you can have that kind of GitHub team collaboration right inside the IDE, so you never have to leave it, which is really helpful. So um, the novelty also is that you never have to leave Visual Studio Code uh, from your development. But with Code Spaces, which is Visual Studio Code, you never have to leave the browser. So Azure uh, Portal uh, with your uh, Cloud Shell, and then you have uh, Code Spaces with uh, your IDE, um, and then you have your PR and requests and everything like that. So we, we're, we're seeing a, a, a move to really distributed computing, but it's not really uh, a distribute. It's in your browser. Everything that I do normally, some days uh, I, I step away from my computer, I go, I never even touched the OS once. It was just browser-based development. Yeah, it's, it's incredible how, how things have shifted, isn't it? It's very cool. Awesome. Uh, last but not least, um, again, there's been this huge paradigm shift, right? As a... Java developer or a .NET developer, if you were if you've been in the industry for say five to ten years plus, um, you were kind of used to bringing up uh, IIS on your own machine or Tomcat or whatever the Java app or web server would be on your local machine, and you kind of do your Java or .NET coding, you'd build your binary, you deploy it to your local machine, and if you thought that was okay, you'd then try and send it off to you know some sort of test system or hand it off to a system administrator to deploy. Uh, but these days, you know, you can just go deploy straight to the cloud environment, Azure in this case, um, from the IDE, and it's all ready to go. Which means you, you know, that kind of fast feedback loop that you really want in your Java development is there immediately. Right, you're pushing immediately from your desktop all the way through the cloud environment. You can go to your web browser or or hit that API endpoint. Um, and see that thing uh, running live immediately. And so Rory's going to show you that uh, as we go through. And it's a very new feature, yeah, and I'll show you. We use a little bit of AR to determine your artifact that you want to deploy. So you don't even have to tell it, uh, you know, the jar that you're going to do. It looks it up in Maven, and you just right-click on your project and go deploy. Uh, and I'll show you. It is very slick. That's very cool. All right, so uh, Rory's going to take over the demo uh, after this, but here are some links uh, that you can follow. Uh, along with. So there's a Java learning path that we've put together for anyone who's interested in, in, in Java. 
Uh, we have the VS Code with the Java extension link there, and the Spring Clinic, Pet Clinic uh, application that uh, Rory will be demonstrating uh, alongside. So that's aka.ms Java hyphen learn hyphen path. And for the VS Code Java, it's aka.ms forward slash VS hyphen code hyphen Java. And for Spring Pet Clinic, it's aka.ms forward slash spring hyphen pet clinic, all one word. And with that, I will hand over to Rory for the demo, which is probably the more interesting part of this first presentation. Off you go, Rory. Thanks, Martin. Uh, and, and so um, you, you can follow on, along. Uh, and uh, if I do go a little bit too fast, uh, sometimes it's only because we are uh, aligned to a schedule. I have 18 minutes to teach you the world right now with this with this demo. So um, I'm going to show you how to get started, and you can always rewatch it if, if uh, you miss a point. So the first thing that Martin didn't tell you is that he actually works in the Open JDK team, and he's he's kind of a rock star. He's a, he's a big thing, um, and he this little uh, toy that that we've got there, Open JDK. Uh, he he pulled miracles, and he's got the Open JDK, and it's the Microsoft version of the Open JDK. So I've got it installed on my Macintosh. It's running Java. 11. So you, you really want to do that. But the demo that we can do today, you can uh, use any Open JDK or any JDK as long as it's compliant with uh, Java 11. So you can download the Open JDK and then I've got it installed here. You can see here I'm running a, a Macintosh because the irony of a Java developer working on a Mac um, uh, working for Microsoft is not lost on me. Don't worry. And then you can go Java dash dash version here. And you'll see there it's got the Microsoft uh, uh, Open JDK. But what you don't know is that this is the same uh, version that actually runs on Azure, uh, on the Azure Cloud Shell. When you go in there and you do dash dash version, you'll see that it's also running there. So very confident that uh, we can actually get this working for our demos because uh, it is working on Azure, the world's cloud. So once you have that, the next thing you want to go is you want to install, and uh, Martin had that link there. Uh, you want to install, let's go find that. Uh, the uh, coding pack. So if you go to code.visualstudio.com uh, and you go to the coding pack for Java, uh, you'll see there that you can, I've installed the Mac OS one, installed the coding pack for Java, and you'll uh, get a, a 71 meg file with all of the extensions you need and to get started here. So uh, let me minimize that. I actually want to go to my desktop. I'm still learning Mac. It's my midlife crisis. So you can see here I've got the coding pack for Java. And I'm going to just double click on here. And it's going to scan your P uh, PC or your Mac and say, uh, what are your prerequisites? Do you have everything there? You can see I've got the, uh, the license agreement. Uh, it's, uh, this is a, an open source. Everything you can see there is uh, under the adopt open JDK, which is really nice. So you can go next. And now it's going to say, OK, what do I have right now? Now I've got JDK 6, uh, 16 already there. And I've got Visual Studio already. So it's not going to really install anything. Uh, but normally, it would install everything for you. Uh, so you're going to go uh, install here. It's going to install the Java extensions, install the Open JD, uh, uh, JDK for you, and uh, it's going to launch Visual Studio Code. So I'm going to click Finish here, and it's going to launch Visual Studio Code. Um, and in Visual Studio Code, I don't have any project open here. You can see in Project View, it's just open here. So you can actually start with a fresh project, but we're going to uh, clone a the Spring Pet, Pet Clinic application. But before I do that, I want to show you how to get started if we weren't going to clone that. So you can go create a Java project or open GitHub repository, clone or open folder. So when you create a Java project, you can actually use something called generators. So generators, you can uh, start from an architect from Maven, Spring Boot, Quarkus, uh, Micro Profile. And these are all built in there. Um, and you can start from afresh there and uh, create and scaffold out your project. So let's go and clone the application. Then I'm going to show you the JDK that I've set up uh, for that application. Um, I don't want to open the JDK just yet. I want to go in and clone the application. So the first thing that I want to show you with that application is that I forked it uh, from the Spring Projects Spring Pet Clinic. So the Spring Pet Clinic there, I, I just went in there and I, uh, I clicked on fork. So if you go here and you just go uh, fork, and it'll say, OK, where do you want a fork? And say, I've already got a, a, a fork there. So that's the fork we're going to use here. Um, and you can just use the normal spring dash projects uh, forward slash spring dash pet clinic. And it's a nice little application there uh, that uh, uh, kind of uh, stores owners uh, with their pets um, and lets you take them to a veterinary uh, clinic. Though. And it runs on localhost 8080. So let, let's take the, the application here. Um, and you can just go uh, uh, local here. Uh, you can copy that, and I'm going to go back into uh, Visual Studio Code, and I'm going to go. Uh, let's go uh, open. Sorry, clone repository. You can clone a repository locally. So I'm going to just paste that in there. 
clone from URL. That's great. Now I'm going to create a new folder here, and I'm going to call this uh, Marmite because I know that one of our producers in the background, uh, uh, Adam, uh, loves Marmite. So we're going to go Marmite there in the Marmite folder and select the repository location. Now I've got the Spring Picnic in the Marmite folder. Um, and it's going to go uh, clone it, and you can click Open afterwards. And uh, now I've clicked Open. I'm going to make that a little bit bigger. I've got my application here, and you'll see immediately it's starting to uh, do a little things there. It's starting to scan my application and say, wow, OK, uh, this, this might be a Java project. I need to bring in some Java uh, power. So opening Java project, and you can go uh, click Detail. And it's, it's setting the class path containers, downloading the Maven uh, dependency for you. Maven's a packet manager, uh, and setting everything up for you. So uh, refreshing workspace, and then it will say to you, uh, wait a second, if everything's gone right, I guarantee nothing on any of these demos, because I've seen everything as, as being in DevRel for, for 10 years. So if something goes wrong, we've got backups of backups of backups. Uh, so now projects are important in the workspace. We can go view projects here. And now it's got the Java project here. Now it's got the views that uh, Martin actually mentioned. You've got your uh, kind of your editor view there. And then you've got your Java project view. And the Java project view is very powerful. You've got, uh, it, it actually explodes them into your source main Java, your source main resources, your, your tests, your uh, Maven dependencies. I can actually click through all of my Maven dependencies and go see exactly what it's doing there. My JRE system dependencies. Now, if I go into my JRE, let's see which JRE it's using. Because I've set my JDK uh, as um, uh, 11, but you can see there, it's actually running compatibility mode of 1.8. So even though the, this, this project is 1.8, it's still using the JDK 11. Visual Studio Code needs JDK 11 to operate because it's got a la language server that sits off process that handles all of your passing that needs uh, JDK 11. So I'm running in uh, compatibil uh, compatibility mode of 1.8, but I'm running with the JDK 11. So that's the uh, project view that you get there. And so let's show you exactly how I, I set this up. So now you can go into uh, view, Command palette, uh, there's a shortcut for that also. Command palette, and in command palette, you can go configure Java runtimes. You can just go Java there, and you can go colon. You get all of those nice views there. Uh, you can get getting started, get some tutorials, class path, help center, and but we're going to go configure Java runtime. And in configure Java runtime, uh, let's just uh, close that for a second there. You'll see that I'm running in Java 1.8 compatibility mode. Uh, the uh, version of the JDK there is uh, uh, 11. Uh, but you can see that. And I can install a JDK also here also, and I can even install the Microsoft Build of Open JDK. We'll click through there and go through there. And I can download and, and install many versions of uh, Open JDK. Now I have many versions of Open JDK. I've got 8, 11, 15, and 16 actually running on my Mac uh, right now. Uh, but the Java tooling runtime just really needs one. And you can see there I've got, uh, oh, I've got Java 16 running for the jo uh, language server. Uh, but for the project JDK, I've actually got uh, Java 11. So yeah, it's, it's all good in the hood. I can uh, mix and match there. And I can run multiple JDKs uh, via that. So that's how you configure your Java runtime. Now, when I go into a Java file, and if I go into main Java, uh, like let's take speciality.java. And I click on speciality.java here. You'll see there that it's actually running there. And uh, I've got the long language server there. And that's the off-process language server. So let's show you some nice features that we have. And I'm going to open up not speciality.java, but owner and the owner controller. I'm going to work through this uh, in, in the beginning. So the owner controller, and then one of the methods here is process uh, find form. And then there's also one, uh, yeah, so find form. And it lets you find an owner there. So let's just first start it, um, and then you'll see exactly uh, what we're, go we're going to do here. So let's go into the Spring Boot dashboard. Uh, let's uh, start it in uh, debug mode there. And we're going to start that up, and we're going to bind to uh, the port of that. So that's the Spring Boot dashboard, and it already knows that it's a Spring project. It's going to bind to port 8080, and then I can actually just go in there on my Spring Boot dashboard and can just go browse. Uh, so if I go into uh, my project view here, I can actually just go uh, uh, open in browser. Um, and this, hopefully, I've got like a 1,000 browsers open because I'm using StreamYard. Let's just go back here, and uh, let's find that browser view. One of the problems I always find with StreamYard is that sometimes I actually close the StreamYard window. So Adam, don't kill me if I do that. Uh, I'll try not to close the StreamYard window. So here's the Spring Picklink application here. Uh, and now I can actually go in here and go find owners. And there's my owners there. And I can actually go and drill through all of that. And that's running now. Uh, in my uh, Spring uh, Clinic. And 
I can actually just close that there, or I can, I'm gonna leave that running now for, and because I wanna show you some debugging features already. So once that I've got, uh, actually I'm gonna close it there. Uh, once that I've got that running, I can actually show you some of the features. So over here, I can look and inspect any of those uh, methods here. I can also right click on owner and see, okay, cool, go to the definition. So uh, go to definition, and right there, I can see that it comes from the method. But I can right click on owner and go, and this is a new feature, show type hierarchy. And it will show me the, the, the parent of the project, person, and base entity and object. And this is, this is quite a nice feature that we've just recently added there uh, that allows you to uh, show uh, type uh, hierarchy. But what happens if, uh, if I want to um, go in and inspect owner there? Uh, I can right click in there and I can go, go to references, super implementation, show uh, core hierarchy or find all implementations. So there's a lot of nice uh, uh, views that you can go for the hierarchy and, and, and views this. Um, okay, so let's go back into there. The next feature I want to do, okay, what, what happens if owner is in the wrong package or if uh, speciality for vet, so a vet can be a specialist, can be a cat or dog, is in the wrong package. So I want to show you how to do refactoring. So the next thing I want to do is uh, refactoring. So I want to drag um, uh, speciality into the owner package. Maybe owner wants a speciality. So I can right click there. Uh, sorry, I can drag that into the owner package. Now watch this. Uh, it will say, are you sure you want to move? And I want to go, yes, I want to move. And I, I click there and it says, okay, cool. Uh, there's, there's some changes we're going to do for you. Uh, do you want to see the preview? So I can go show preview and check that out. Now I get all of the changes that it's going to do on my behalf. So I can drag files from packages and do refactoring there without having to worry. And this is great for team collaboration. So I'm going to go, yes. Uh, please go and make those changes. Now, speciality is now in a different package. You can see there it's in the owner package. And I can prove that because I can go into uh, my source control and you can see all my files now uh, have changed. But I want to change that back. Uh, so I want to check uh, speciality, drag it back to vet, uh, click move again, uh, show preview. And if all goes well, uh, then we should have nothing actually <laughs> in the source control here once it gets... Uh, refresh, look at that, and it's it's perfect there. So that's that's how you can do uh, refactoring, and you can do auto refactoring also with that. You can also right click on there uh, on speciality, and you can do uh, refactor where we go over there, and you can move it here, or uh, you can do a lot of other features there uh, with uh, refactoring. So let's go next to um, our and I did promise uh, uh, GitHub Code Pilot. So in owner controller here, uh, so owner controller is a REST controller. Uh, and you can see there it has an owner repository uh, that it uses for owners, though. So if I click on here, uh, and uh, and I uh, let me just make sure your GitHub Copilot is on here. I can go. You can see it's already trying to close the bracket there. I can go this dot, and it'll tell me what it recommends to to do, uh, or it will actually give me uh, if GitHub Copilot uh, tells me uh, the code that it recommends there. So I actually want to get out of the getters and setters. I want to get. Uh, uh, yeah, let's 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 uh, go to something. So let's go uh, set allowed fields, and in that I want to go data binder 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 dot and uh, uh, did I spell that right? Set uh, disallowed fields, and uh, okay, that's not working. Also, let's go into something a little bit simpler for GitHub Copilot. Don't fail me now, GitHub uh, Copilot. I am trying to impress the audience. So let's go here uh, and into our, our controller. This is the controller for the entire application here. And I know this works with GitHub Copilot. Uh, so let's let's go see here. And for that, I can go, uh, if I take a spring uh, application, and you can see there, it actually picks up what I'm supposed to run. Uh, so it actually knows the spring application, and I can just go tab for GitHub Copilot, and it'll fill that in for me. Uh, so it does work on not necessary every method but it actually knows what I'm supposed to do. Now, if I go, uh, that is GitHub Copilot, but if I go spring application dot, and then it will tell me, and I can go control, I think it's uh, oh, control space. No, not that one, uh, option space there. No, uh, control space, there we go. Now check what it does there. It actually gives me a star. Now what that star is, it actually learns from millions of other developers of what the common method is that they use. So not only does GitHub Pilot, uh, Copilot fill it in, but this is IntelliSense. 
it intelligently finds out the perfect method to run uh, when you want to actually run it. So I can just click on there uh, and uh, click on run, and it will know what you want to do uh, when you do that. So between GitHub Copilot and IntelliSense, it actually does a lot uh, that you want to actually do. Let's see if we can actually get it. Uh, I don't want to move that there into a repository here. Let's see if we can get it to actually uh, talk to, I don't want the implementation. Uh, I want the pet repository. I want a little bit, uh, yeah, there's pet. Um, so in pets here, I can actually go uh, the two string. So let's go, let's see if we can create a two string here. Uh, so uh, public uh, two string, two string. Um, but I don't want to type that myself. Uh, it's, it's, a bit, it's a bit too bothersome. So I want to actually get that generated. Uh, so I can go in here and I can right click here and I can go source action. Uh, and then uh, generate uh, generate two string. Look at that. You can you can generate a lot of things through here. You can generate tests, organize inputs. But I want to generate a two string here, and you can choose the methods that you want to do with the two string. And I can go OK, and it will generate and override the two string that you have here. That that is pretty interesting. That's a really powerful uh, IDE feature here. So you can also generate tests. Now in the tests that we have here, if I go into a uh, test and Java, and I go into uh, owner service here, and owner controller test here. I've got tests here that tests uh, before each for, and sets up those owners there, uh, initialize the creation form, and it does a lot of those tests. Now I can generate a lot of those tests. If I go right to the bottom here, and I click there, I can go right click here, and I can go source action, uh, generate tests, and it would give me all of the different things that I can actually do. Uh, so after all, uh, after each, before all, and I can go test method there. So this is a nice feature, and it'll uh, generate all of the kind of scaffolding out for you to do that. OK, so those are some of the features. I've showed you auto refracting, uh, the top uh, hierarchy, how it picks up a lot of the features from uh, Maven, IntelliSense and GitHub Copilot, the project view uh, settings, the Spring dashboard. Uh, next, I want to show you the final feature um, before we go to Azure is the uh, debugging. But before I do that, I, I want to make sure that I haven't broken my project. OK, so let me undo the owner controller there, discard changes. And I want to undo the pet there, discard uh, mm -hmm. changes. Let's close all of that there. Uh, and I want to go uh, close all here. Now, let's go do some debugging. So on uh, owner controller here, uh, I'm gonna. Uh, I want to see who is the owner that I'm gonna do here, and I'm gonna put a little debug statement here. You can actually put uh, edit breakpoints. You can put conditional breakpoints there. So I'm gonna put a, just a standard breakpoint there. I'm gonna go into my Spring Boot dashboard there, and now I'm gonna click on the little debug function. Now, when it uh, opens up, um, the first thing that it's going to do when it uh, uh, finds uh, an owner, it's going to break there, and it's going to give me a lot of debugging, rich debugging features that uh, I'll get. So uh, I can click on the little open in browser, um, and then, uh, it, of course, it's going to open a, in a browser above me because StreamYard is the, uh, uh, there we go, there we go. Here. So here's my little pet clinic, uh, let's go, uh, application. No, that was the previous one there. And here's the pet clinic application. Now, I'm going to put this on the side here, and I'm going to show you as I debug. Uh, so I'm going to go find the owner, uh, find owners there, uh, find owners, and then it's it's actually broken there. You can see there uh, it's uh, it's broken there. Uh, but more importantly, it's actually showed me a new feature that we've just launched there. It actually shows me owner there, but it's got inline uh, 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 debugging uh, options there. You can see there it actually prints them out. It's not actually uh, printing them out there uh, in real, uh, really, but it's got them in gray there. So you can see all the variables. It gives you a lot more options now to do that. Uh, and I can see the owner there. I can even put a watch on owner, so I can go um, uh, watch. Let's go add a watch there. I can go owner, uh, owner. It'll give me the owner there. And I can right click on owner and I can go uh, edit expression. But I can also see the local variables here. And I can right click on the local variables here. And I can go enable logical view structure, disable two string object view, show static variables. All of these are new uh, features and can set value there. Um, and But I can debug the classic debug. I can go uh, step over there and go into all of that uh, via uh, the, the features here. Or I can just go continue there. And so it's a lot of, it's it's really a, a fully fledged uh, IDE here. So let's let's chuck this project over to uh, Azure now. So let's uh, let's stop that there. Now to to do it in Azure, it is so difficult. It's so incredibly difficult. No, it's not. It's it's very simple. Well, first of all, you have to just set up your uh, Azure project. Let me make this a little bit bigger here, uh, and uh, let's make that bigger. 
you have to s just set up your Azure account, and I've already done that there. So you can just go view command palettes, and I can go uh, Azure sign in. So I've already signed in. I'm not going to do that right now because I have to take my phone and uh, that. But uh, I've selected my uh, subscription and I've signed in. And then once you do that, uh, check this. Uh, uh, I just have to go to an empty view there. I can right click there and go uh, deploy to web app. It's as simple as that. So deploy to web app there. I'm going to add the config because it, it needs a config in this project there. And then it's going to say, okay, what web app do you want to do? Uh, do you want to use an existing one or do you want to use uh, uh, an old one? Now, Brian, um, sorry, uh, Martin and I did have a backup. We called it Tech Days UK uh, in case anything goes wrong. So we're going to go, okay, cool. Uh, what is the next uh, create a new web app? So I'm going to go create a new web app there. And then I'm going to say, let's call this here uh, because we, we, we do love Marmite. So Marmite uh, RPZA. No one would choose that app name. Okay, that's great. Select the runtime stack, uh, Java 8, uh, because we are running in Java 8 compatibility. We're going to choose Java SE because we're running in Spring. You can choose JBoss EAP, Tomcat, uh, JBoss EAP. We're going to use the premium one because I really like Pile. And also, don't pay for my Azure account. <laughs> um, and then uh, we're going to go, uh, it's going to go create everything and provision our resources. Now, this takes about two to three minutes. Uh, to run. You can see there it, it's going to create your application insights for you. Now, what is application insights? Um, and your application insights is your distributed tracing and logging that is out of the box uh, included as part of uh, your app service uh, agentless monitoring. Um, you do pay a very small uh, kind of data charge uh, for application insights. Um, so as a result, they do get you when you create your app and you publish it there to just switch on a little feature there to say uh, uh, you do want application insights. But So we're going to set up application insights. It's, uh, it's creating the new app there. And you can see all of this through the Azure view in the, the Azure Toolkit view for Visual Studio. So if I click on refresh here, there's my subscription. And if I go into my subscription here, you'll see there that I've got the Marmot RPZA uh, uh, application there. Um, it's asking me what port you want there in the next thing. And I'm going to say port 8080 is fine with me. And now it's going to go and run a Maven build and deploy that through there. Uh, I'd say, yes, I want to deploy that all the time. Now it's running the pre-build the pre and it's going to actually get the jar, find the jar for me using a bit of AI, and then chuck that jar over to uh, Azure. Now it's building, it's working with an H2 database. Uh, but Martin and I are going to show you how to connect this a little bit later to a MySQL database. So this is running here, but at the same time this is running, you can actually right click on this in the app service here and you can go start streaming logs. So you can go start streaming logs and this is the application logs. So there's the deployment log, which we're going to see now. It's going to say uh, running the, uh, the deployment task there and it's going to say I'm zipping the file up and, and popping in there, but you can also get the application log. So let's wait for it to actually uh, finish the initialization. It's running all those tests there. Uh, um, hopefully that runs through there. Uh, okay, no active profile sets. It's taking a little bit of strain. I have noticed in this Mac, it's getting a little bit hot. And I know that a lot of people complain that when Macs get hot, oh, that's not good news. Uh, okay, so um, it is uh, running the pre-deployed task and it's running through all, all of those tests there. A few too many tests, I think. Uh, it's uh, running through that. But while it's doing that, you can actually go into your application server and you can go start streaming logs. So let's switch on logs. The first time you're going to do that, it's going to uh, stream the, the, the log stream. We shouldn't see anything because the application hasn't been loaded. It's, it's just a, an empty log. And if we go in there before it actually uh, deploys, uh, we can go browse, browse website. There isn't anything there. Uh, it's, uh, of course, going to go above me. Uh, and let's go, let's, let's minimize. Uh, let's go here, and that's what we want. Uh, and then it's just going to have an empty uh, a view here. And wow, we're up and running. Now we, we're still uh, deploying the Marmot RPZA uh, application there. And once that's finished, then you should be able to get uh, the actual, oh, there's the, the logs there for the application logs. It's initializing the, the warm requests. Uh, and then deployment is uh, su as successful. But I want to just stream the logs. I want to see what's actually going on there. So let's make that a little bit bigger. Okay, so it's, uh, it's, it's streaming the logs there. And it will take a few seconds to actually uh, get through there. But through this Azure portal here, you can see a lot of things. You can create a database connection, the application settings, the deployment slots. You can actually see the deployment that we did there, uh, see the logs uh, there. You can see that's the deployment log. And you can right-click on that and go 
uh, view deployment logs. And in that view deployment logs, you'll see there that it zipped up a file and actually deployed it to my application server. Ah, there, it's deployed there. And right at the bottom there, I can see that it's completed the application. So I can go into my uh, Marmite RPZA. I can right click there and I can go browse website. Um, and uh, uh, it will uh, connect. Uh, let me just minimize that for a second. Uh, it will connect there, and there's my application. Marmot RPZA is running there. I can go, uh, let me uh, uh, not do full screen uh, here. I can actually go find owners here, and it's running, and I can find the owners. Now, I haven't switched on application insight, so let's go do that here. Uh, let's, uh, and then we can see the telemetry there, and then I'll hand back over to uh, Martin here. So if I go into my Azure portal here, uh, let me just close that uh, and minimize that. If I go into my uh, Azure portal, uh, make it a little bit bigger, um, then I can go into App Services. Now, we, we want to find uh, Marmot RPZA. Mm -hmm. There it is there. Uh, and uh, and Marmot RPZA <coughs> has all of the nice features here. We've got the resource group. Uh, it's located in West Europe. Uh, I can uh, see that's got a service plan there. And I can go into my application insights, which we're going to demo heavily because it's a new feature. And I can just go turn on application insights. Once I turn it on and I hit, hit apply, it'll uh, start collecting telemetry for me. So uh, once it's going there, I'm going to create some telemetry. And then I'm going to come back to this a little bit later. This is a new feature. So this is agentless. It means it's going to have distributed end-to-end -end tracing for the application we just did. We just right-clicked and deployed it to uh, Azure. We didn't really change anything. And we're going to operationalize it with distributed tracing. We'll, sh we'll see, show it in the next uh, demo. I'm going to hand it over to Martin, and we'll take some questions also. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Rory, for that incredible whirlwind of a uh, tour of Visual Studio Code. That was really cool. A um, couple of things I wanted to add. A uh, slight word of caution when it comes to using those auto-generated uh, features in terms of you know writing your two strings and your hash codes, your, your equals methods, etc. Please, please, please remember that when you go and change any of your uh, member variables of your classes to go and regenerate, uh, otherwise those two strings and those equals and hash codes will, will no longer be correct. So that's just a, a reminder for all of us. So I, I figure as well, I have a little post-it note uh, above <laughs> my monitor to remind me uh, on, on a daily basis. Um, very cool to see the deployment to, to Azure there. So yeah, Azure App Service, um, it is our uh, primary uh, PaaS uh, platform as a service. If you want to deploy you know, a standard uh, Java EE or Jakarta EE or MicroProfile style application, we have options there for Tomcat, uh, JBoss, or bring your own container. Uh, so whichever way you want to do it, uh, you, you can bring it that way for sure. Now we have a stack of questions, it seems, that have come up. Um, so I'm going to put you on the spot now, Rory, and we're going we're to have a little Rory test. Uh, no, I'll, I'll help out as well. well. We'll see what we've got here. There's quite a few. They're going to go all the way back up the stream. And before I get into the questions, I actually just wanted to talk a little bit about the poll results. So um, a, not, a, a small percentage of you are actually watching the stream as a bit of a guilty pleasure to get away from doing <laughs> doing your real work today. So uh, I really appreciate the honesty there for the 11% uh, of you who said, I am procrastinating and watching the stream uh, because I don't want to get back to editing YAML, maybe. Maybe editing YAML is, is the horrible thing that people have to do these days. Um, uh, a whole bunch of you uh, were super interested to understand what Microsoft is doing with, with Java and are very curious about where, where that's all going. So. If you have specific questions, please do feel free to add them. Um, we're pretty open and honest and transparent here at Microsoft with regards to Java. So um, you can ask us anything, uh, and we will do our level best to uh, to give you uh, an open answer as, as possible. Um, right, on to the questions here. Gosh, there's so many I have to scroll through. Uh, comment here, didn't know that Microsoft devs are allowed to have Twitch accounts. Yes, we can. Um, we're we're up, up with the cool kids, aren't we, Rory? It's all good. Um, scrolling through some comments about Copilot, Adam claiming he doesn't really like Marmite, which I just just don't believe <laughs> at all. Um, audience questions, right? Uh, where can I find out, Rory, what the latest uh, advancements for uh, Java support and Visual Studio Code? So, where can I keep up with the release notes and, and future announcements and things? Okay, yes, uh, so. The Java language pack is actually part of the Microsoft Java extension pack. Uh, 
Um, so uh, when you install it, you install the Visual Studio Code extension. Now that's all open source. You can actually go in there and you can see the, the change log for that. But it's actually a pack of six uh, uh, services that we have. So Maven, uh, test package, um, the actual language server, and then there's one or two more. So if you uh, share my screen, I'll show you where you can actually see and you can get a view for that. So first of all, so this is the uh, the Marmot RPZA uh, uh, place of goodness, and we're back there. And now you can go into extensions, and you can see there you can uh, you can get a list of all extensions that is installed. So I've got a lot of extensions here, but one of the the ones that I've installed is the uh, and I can just search for uh, Java, and you can see there I've got uh, quite a few uh, Java language packs. But you can see there I've got the extension pack for Java. So the extension pack for Java includes these language, uh, these uh, extensions. Let me just close it there. The uh, uh, let me just make it smaller. Um, the uh, language support for Java, so the actual language server, uh, the debugger for Java, the test runner for Java, the Maven for Java, project manager for Java, and then Visual Studio IntelliJ code. Now each one of those, you can actually go in there and view the GitHub uh, change log for that. So the extension pack for Java, I can go there and click on the change log, and it will show me all of those features that, that I have there. I can also go into uh, language support, for example. I can go into the change log and see exactly what language support was uh, which was changed. Uh, one of the nice things here is you can see when the records come in, or uh, you can see there, uh, they uh, we, we partner with uh, Red Hat to do that. So you allow folding static blocks. There's a lot of nice features there that you can actually do that. And there is a blog, and there's also an entire website. If you remember where I installed it, so if I go code.visualstudio, the Java tutorial, uh, there's a, an entire website where you can actually get uh, information there about getting started with Visual Studio Code. And it's a, it's a tutorial. Most of the things I've showed you today I actually got from the, the tutorial there, configuring your Java runtime, uh, doing debugging, uh, refactoring, um, uh, running debugging. So yeah, so uh, you can access all of there and also it's all open source there. So you can even get uh, a view on uh, the tutorials uh, a history there and uh, you, you can see you can just click and edit it there. So yeah, so you can access it on GitHub. You can see all the change logs there and the easiest way is to just use the language pack and, and download it and keep it updated there and then just switch on auto updates and it'll get all the niceties as, as you progress. Cool. Thanks, Rory. Um, I think that covers the next couple of questions. So uh, a couple of questions here. One was, how can I use a Visual Studio Code with new Java versions? Uh, so they just come in every time a new major version of Java is released. So Java is now released on a six-month cadence. So Java 17 is being actually released this week. We're all be busy beavering away behind the scenes on that one. Um, and you'll see that the language extension pack for Java will catch up with, say, the Java 17 features, uh, you know, usually within weeks or, or maybe only up to a month uh, afterwards. Because obviously, we're keeping up to date behind the scenes with OpenJDK and, and adding features that are early access and things as we go. So today, you can use Java 16, for example, fully with Visual Studio Code and use those features like records and the enhanced switch statements and things. Um, and you know, in the not too distant future, Java 17 support will be fully fluted there as well. Um, there's another question around like what are the new features coming to Java Visual Studio Code? I think Rory just uh, showed you the links, et cetera, where you can look at our roadmap there going forward. Uh, Before so we end, Great. I did Great. promise you that I'll show you the distributed tracing. So I, it's finished its telemetry. So we can go back there if you uh, want to share my screen. So on my pet tank application, while uh, we've been uh, discussing, uh, I've uh, shown and seen that the telemetry is finished. That's a lot. It's a big funnel that the telemetry can actually uh, take. But we've uh, we've got that now. So I switched it on. And the application insights is now tracking uh, exactly what I did on my app services. So you go to app services. Uh, we go to uh, Adam's uh, Marmot uh, RPZA. And then uh, we can go through application insights. So let's go through to, uh, uh, let's go there. Uh, we want to find application insights. Where are you? Uh, alerts. Oh, uh, I think I'm already. There we go. Application insights. You think that I'm actually an Azure developer. Uh, <laughs> um, and then I can go there, uh, view the application insights data. And now I can go to the application map. Now look at this distributed tracing. Now it's using the H2 database. Um, and it's going to show me my, uh, my actual service, my website. And it's going to say how many calls I did, 46 calls. 2% of them actually had failures. I take no responsibility for those failures. Um, and then it's speaking to a SQL database. I can click through 
uh, on each of those and see what are the get calls for that. So I can see uh, those are the get calls. I can even click through on the SQL and see the slowest performing SQL database call there also. Um, so let's click through on a get owners edit. So editing an owner. And I can see here that on the server, I can also uh, use JavaScript to do the browser. Uh, we haven't done that yet. I can uh, zoom in here. Remember, this is all enabled just from that little click there. And now I can see, wait a second, those are the calls. Those are the response times, the response count. Uh, and uh, now if I click on through that, I can click on dependencies and look how cool this is. Now I can see the database calls, the underlying database calls. So all the select statements here, I can go into each one of those. Um, and let's find one, uh, select uh, owner ID. And I can go into samples. So I can click on samples. And now I can go into the select statement here. Now watch this. This is where the magic really happens. Now I click on that, and it's an end-to-end -end transaction for that uh, for that call, for that website call. So I've got the uh, init initialize update owner, and it will show me the SQL call there, uh, and also link through to how long each one of those took. So the actual, uh, it's a little bit slow because I'm only running one CPU for my, my web server. It took two seconds. But the uh, the actual Java code took 228 milliseconds. The database calls were so quick, it took zero milliseconds, so actually no latency. And then to actually render the form there uh, in total, 1.7 seconds. So the rendering actually took the longest. And you get all of that. You can see all the telemetry. You can see the user flows, the dependency flows, also uh, the page flows in end to end. And this was just enabled, Martin, with that little bit uh, you can see that's the user flows there with a little bit of application insights. And that's what I wanted to show you. Over Back to you, Martin. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, so under the hood, uh, that's um, uh, for the Java piece, that's uh, installed as a Java agent. So for those of you who have ever tinkered with command line, it's a minus minus Java agent that gets attached to the JVM. And it's, uh, it's open telemetry based. So it's actually uh, an open telemetry standardized uh, agent. Uh, and we're actually enhancing it. So one of the things my group is working on is adding the ability to trigger Java flight recordings uh, when you have a breach of some sort of service level agreement. So uh, Rory there showed you, for example, this end-to-end -end transaction took two, two, two seconds because he's only running on one CPU. If you chose uh, sometime in the future to say, hey, that's not acceptable and we want to understand why, not only can you look at that distributed uh, transaction timing and see, okay, where was the time spent? But you can also get a Java flight recording out uh, as well as some extra intelligence we're building in to tell you, you know, was it garbage collection or was I writing too many log files to disk or was I just writing some poor code? Um, we'll give you those insights going forward. Cool. Um, I know this particular section of this whole two and a half hours is going a little bit over time, but I think we have a, a lot of interest around this particular set of developer tooling. So I think we'll continue with the questions and we'll, we'll just have a little slightly shorter time on, on the two on the two services, but that, that's absolutely fine. Uh, right. So let's see what else we've got here on the list. Uh, is Rory, is Rory a South African? Yes. <laughs> yes, he is. Brew, I'm uh, as South African as they come. Eh? If you can't hear my Afrikaans accent, the only thing I can't pronounce is Martin's name. I mean, it's never going to happen. Eh? <laughs> Excellent. Um, somebody commented here. So Rory mentioned earlier that Application Insights does incur a small uh, data fee. So for you know transferring all of the uh, the logs and the metrics and stuff into your Azure storage. Um, so someone here commented, uh, you know, do we get something here for free to start with as a, as a as a starting point? Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, yes, you, you get you, you get two hundred dollars as part of your Azure account. Um, yeah, yeah, it is two hundred dollars, um, and uh, you you get that for uh, free for I think a year, uh, something spectacular uh, for that though. So you, if you want to sign up for an Azure account, uh, you can just go to uh, www. Well, not w. No one uses w anymore. HTTPS uh, and then Azure dot com. Uh, let's just go see there. Uh, Azure dot com. I think it's Azure dot com. Let's just make sure. Uh, let's yeah, uh, Azure dot com. So you can just sign up for Azure.com. You get 12 months uh, of popular free cloud services plus a $200 credit. Uh, so yeah, that's a that's a great uh, a great uh, start. Students also get even more, and you don't even have to if you're a student, you don't even have to use a credit card. Yeah, perfect. Um, and next question, and I think possibly the last one on this stack is: uh, Does Visual Studio Code work uh, or integrate cleanly with WSL2L? Windows subsystem for Linux. 
Uh, yes, it does, because my other laptop I've got here, my mistress laptop actually uh, is WSL2, um, and uh, it works very well there. I actually uninstalled CMD on my la laptop, um, command line prompt, and I've, I'm running WSL2. Uh, and then I, I, I actually had a, a demo where I showed WSL2 with code spaces uh, and going through it uh, to there. So definitely Linux. If you're, if you're Linux flavored, definitely WSL2. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I had to do the same thing. So I've got a Surface Book Pro sitting next to me here as well. And, you know, I kept forgetting that it's DIR in command, right? Just a list of directories. So I was like, no, I want to use LS minus LA. Ah. And so, yeah, using WSL, uh, yeah, saved, saved my sanity for, for sure. Um, cool. So I think that wraps us up for this particular section. Uh, thanks so much for everybody who have uh, tuned in so far. Don't forget, you can just ask us anything. So please do ask questions away. We're happy to answer all sorts of questions around you know what Microsoft's up to with Java and where we think it's going in the future. Um, and uh, apart from that, I think we're going to take a short five minute break. Is that right, Adam? Yes, I think we are going to do an intermission because uh, my caffeine levels are dangerously low. So I want to just, I have a Red Bull that is just eyeing me right there. I'm going to go drink that. All right. So uh, we will resume in, I think it's five minutes time. Uh, but in the meantime, yeah, feel free to keep firing those questions through and uh, we'll be back shortly. Sustainable software engineering is an emerging discipline at the intersection of climate science, software, hardware, electricity markets, data center, design. The eight principles of sustainable software engineering are this core set of competencies that you need to know in order to build and run sustainable applications. But as well as the eight principles, I would also say there are these two philosophies in sustainable software engineering. The first is that everyone has a part to play in the solution. Where I think we've failed in the past is by making sustainability this exclusive club, where only if you can show that your work reduces carbon emissions by 50% are you worthwhile speaking to. The truth is that nothing happens in isolation. Every, everything is connected. Everyone is part of the solution. Small changes lead to big changes. Just the act of normalizing a discussion about sustainability in technical meetings will empower others to raise their voice. That's how you create change in any organization. Everyone has a part to play. The second philosophy is that sustainability all by itself is enough to justify our work. In the past, we had to wrap sustainability in these little pills to make it easier to swallow. Just doing something for the sake of sustainability wasn't enough. As sustainable software engineers, we recognize there are many advantages to building sustainable applications. They're almost always cheaper. They're often more performant and they're often more resilient as well. But the primary reason we are doing this is for sustainability. Everything else is an added advantage. Sustainability is enough all by itself to justify our work. Being green means different things to different people. And that makes it quite a challenge when it comes to communication or even just figuring out what to optimize for. As Microsoft's sustainability, we have a couple of different ways to look at sustainability. We look at carbon, waste, water, and ecosystems. But for sustainable software engineering, we're narrowing down our focus to just carbon. And what is carbon? So carbon is short for carbon dioxide. It's the most common greenhouse gas in the atmosphere and, and greenhouse gases act as a blanket warming up the planet. It's actually a natural phenomenon. Um, greenhouse gases have been in our atmosphere and increase and decrease in concentrations over hundreds of thousands of years, which means that the temperature on the surface of the planet of the Earth changes naturally in a cycle over hundreds of thousands of years. But it happens very, very slowly, very, very slowly, so slowly the animals, plants, and humanity just have time to adapt. So imagine forests slowly migrating across continents. That's the kind of geographic timescales we're talking about. But now, through, to, through human activities, we're pumping out vast amounts of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere very, very quickly. Too quick for animals, plants, and humanity to adapt to. 
And what we can do in the engineering space to be part of the climate solution is to build applications that are what's called carbon efficient. Now we all emit carbon in our everyday activities in life. But what we need to do and what our goal is, is for each gram of carbon that we emit into the atmosphere, make sure we get as much value out of that as possible in our use, use for it. When buying fridge freezers, do you want to buy a fridge freezer with an energy rating of F? Or do you want to buy a fridge freezer with an energy rating of A? That's what I think of when I think of being green. Being green is all about being efficient. And being carbon efficient is about building applications that add the same value to you or to your customers, but emit less carbon. That's why the first principle of sustainable software engineering is to build applications that are carbon efficient. Hi everyone, this is Adam, your show producer. Thanks for being with us on Tech Days. Just a reminder that this show is completely live if you're watching us um, on Microsoft events, YouTube or Twitch. Um, please do keep asking your questions throughout. Um, we are running slightly behind. That's uh, always the peril of a live show. Um, but we do have some sections coming up on app services for Java, develop, uh, Java applications and enterprise workloads with Azure Spring Clouds. Hopefully you'll continue asking questions questions. And also note that we've got a Java Cloud Skills Challenge as well. So if you fancy learning a bit more via Microsoft Learn, go to this link, ak.ms forward slash tech days forward slash Java challenge. So I think we're almost ready. Um, I've got Rory. We are missing Martin off the feed. Hopefully he'll be back soon. And I can see he's just joining us. So we'll go back to them now. Thank you very much. Hey, welcome back, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Um, and I've got my um, Red Bull here. Uh, it is sugar free. I am 42. So I mean, like, I, I can't drink sugar, but I can drink Red Bull. So it's semi fun. Um, uh, so and we've got a lot to show you because now, now, now it gets really fun because now we've got an app service. Now we're going to go in and uh, publish uh, uh, a few things. Um, now, now you know that we, we can, uh, we're, um, we're, we're cooking with gas. Uh, so we're going to show you uh, how to use Terraform, how to use GitHub Actions, uh, how to uh, wire it to a database, how to operationalize it. And then we'll look at that uh, once we wire it to a database, a little bit of the more distributed tracing. So uh, Martin, you've got some uh, nice uh, uh, information to show us. Yeah, so I'll go through a little little slide deck. I promise to be fast uh, because you know this is a slide deck which has lots of beautiful graphics and things which are aimed at uh, introducing people to App Service. But we understand this audience is a developer audience and would much rather see the code and, and see see the live demo. So, as I go through the slide, I'll also speak a little bit to uh, you know where Microsoft is going with Java and things. I know many of you uh, logged on and when we're curious about that, so I'll try and give uh, a little bit of insight into that. So I'm going to do the old uh, screen share. Here here, which is going to work perfectly first time as it always does. Here we go. All right, that's looking good, isn't it? Bunch of happy people there. Fantastic. All right. They look so happy. I don't know if they're developers. <laughs> you know, the, the, the skin is way too good for a developer. I was about to say they're looking far, far too calm. No, no product, no production mishaps there. Push to um, production. Push to production. Off, off we go. So. Um, Obviously, the world of software development has changed for all of you who are, who are watching here live. You know, the old days of um, writing a massive Word document with all the requirements and then writing some code, deploying that to your local machine, then throwing that code to your fellow engineers so that they could test it on their machine and this really horrible waterfall approach that has just, just gone, right? Uh, we need to, to modernize our code bases and the way we're doing things. Um, and one of the ways uh, to do that is to you know, make it really fast and easy to deploy straight to, to production. Got to have your checks and balances, don't get me wrong, um, but it's, it's super important for us to, to go, go faster. All right, so we're just going to skip through that. We're not going to worry about this too much. Ah, here we go. This, this is an interesting bit. So one of the key strategies that uh, we're trying to... Um, demonstrate to you as, as a Java developer or a .NET developer, either or, um, or just you know someone who wants to run on cloud is that 
we understand at Microsoft that you have really complicated enterprise applications and services, right? And they don't all just kind of fit neatly into a PaaS environment or to some sort of um, uh, deployment scenario where we as Microsoft are dictating to you exactly how you should go deploy this thing, right? There's all sorts of strange uh, third-party dependencies you might rely on, which may need um, you know, very specific connectivity or may need their own specialized service to start up themselves. And so you can see here that you know, we offer um, all the way through from infrastructure as a service, so you can just start with VMs or just start with our container service. Right? We offer platform as a service as well, all the way through to software as a service if you've got a specialized business need. So, However you want to bring your Java workload and your Java application to Azure, uh, we can do that for you. Now, we're going to show primarily App Service and Spring Cloud a little bit later today. Um, but if you need to just bring your application and get it running on a VM, uh, you absolutely have that choice. And we can then help you modernize that application to use some of these services and to get you that faster feedback loop uh, later on. All right. so. What we're really talking about here is, uh, in the modern cloud sense, if you want full control, you can hand drive and uh, manage your own Kubernetes. Um, I personally don't like doing that. I dare I say it, I would be very surprised if any of you on this uh, stream uh, would enjoy doing that. So what we really want to get to is go all the way to the right-hand side there, where we're really talking about kind of um, event-driven functions or, or function as a service. Um, most of us these days, we sit happily in the middle there somewhere, right? Where we've got web apps, we either deploy to a VM or we deploy to some sort of platform as a service, which is what we're, we're going to be covering today. All right. Um, this is Azure App Service today. Um, especially for the .NET side, this has been a, an absolute workhorse uh, for folks who want to run .NET workloads. And we actually have a surprisingly large number of uh, Java customers on here as well. I say surprising Martin. only... Yes, go ahead. Martin, did you know that uh, Microsoft runs 500,000 Java virtual machines internally just to run uh, certain Azure services, LinkedIn, Yammer, uh, and that's excluding customer workloads. I don't know if you uh, were aware of that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. We deploy our Microsoft Build of Open JDK to all of those. Um, and yeah, so LinkedIn, for example, is probably one of the most sophisticated Java customers uh, in the world. Uh, and for those of you who, are, who have children or who are children at heart, if you open up Minecraft, the Java edition, and have a sneaky look at the Java that's actually powering that, you'll see it's Microsoft's build of OpenJDK and running I, Java 16. I didn't know that. Uh, that's, yeah, that's that, that cool. is good. So that's kind of part of our Java modernization strategy that, that we have at Microsoft as well, right? We really want to bring people modern, new Java, and we, we started with our, ourselves internally. Awesome. So Azure App Service, uh, you have a whole bunch of uh, support here. Um, I'm just going to go right past this, but the important one to note there is that it supports .NET, Java, PHP, Node. So anything you want to bring to App Service, you can. Um, and we have full support for .NET and Java in, in particular. All right. Um, I'm going to skip past this. This is not as interesting as demo. I'll cover this one briefly. Um, of course, it is never easy migrating your on-premise software uh, from that data center and from that, you know, usually that monolithic application design uh, to a cloud environment, right? Networking is different, file storage is different, security models are different, the data stores are different. Um, and so we have a migration assistant that can help you with that. Um, so I'll pause on the screen just for a little bit and just note there the URL at the bottom. So it ends in Microsoft.com, uh, and the start piece is app migration, all one word. So if you want to get some assistance from tooling to migrate your application across, app migration.microsoft.com is the place you want to go. All right. We have lots of different migration uh, options as well. We've got the migration tool that I mentioned before. You can deploy straight from Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code, as you saw Rory demonstrate earlier. Uh, you can also just go straight via your Docker Hub, right, or um, your own container registry. So any of those uh, deployment methods are supported by App Service. So depending on where you are in your cloud native journey, um, you can shift stuff across. 
All right, and here is a bunch of options that I mentioned previously. So again, you can use the Azure command line. That's the AZ web app up um, piece there shown there. You can deploy from GitHub, Azure repositories, uh, VS Code, Bitbucket. Really doesn't matter where your code's deployed. You can you can go send it through. All right, uh, continuing here, you can again deploy from VS Code. Jenkins, of course, is a very popular CI CD pipeline for Java engineers in particular, so we support that. Uh, and of course, Maven plugin and Gradle plugin, it's all been uh, added. And so, however you want to get your yeah, code those, to app service, you can. Those developers will go mad for that. Gradle is so fast. Now, literally, Gradle would take what a Maven uh, build would do um, and, uh, you know, a, a, quarter the time and 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 just so performant in that. If you go to the DevOps starters on Azure, we actually finished migrating most of those DevOps starters uh, and to Gradle. So uh, go into your Azure portal, do a DevOps starters, and you'll see that we're actually using Gradle. Awesome. All right. Uh, containers, of course. Uh, you can get containers. You can pull those containers from Docker Hub. You can pull them from the Azure Container Registry, if that's where you're storing them, or your own private container registry, which for some folks is very important with regards to uh, securing their supply chain. You'll see up in the top right-hand corner there, we've also just snuck in there the little GitHub Actions logo. That's because you can also pull them from GitHub Actions these days. Um, so however you want to get your container into Azure App Service, uh, that is also uh, supported, which is very cool. So to conclude, you can build on your terms, right? Use the IDE that you're familiar with, use the build tool you're familiar with, use the deployment mechanism CI CD pipeline you're familiar with, uh, and that includes things like Terraform and Ansible as well, which Rory is going to demonstrate shortly. Uh, this is all automatable, of course. Uh, none of us like to do manual deployments anymore. Um, a shout out to my uh, program management peer, Bruno Borge. He loves YAML. So please do follow him on Twitter. Yeah, please Steve hashtag Borsch. him on YAML. Every time, every YAML, YAML session that you do, just hashtag him on YAML. He, he'll be very appreciative. Yeah, he will absolutely love you for it. Um, fantastic. All right, benefits of app service for applications. So you get the premium uh, V3 SK, uh, SKU from Azure. So you, you're going to get a, a decent fast SKU, much like the one They that shut me down. For. They only gave me three of them. Like, they yeah. were so powerful. <laughs> 16 gigs. Sorry, 16 CPU and like 32 gigs that actually the, the product owner says I'm only allowed three. Uh, yeah, I did spin up like 100, but that, that's not important. Those things are just magnificent. And they, the nice thing about them, they actually have built-in VNet support, the, the premium V3s. Uh, I, 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 could have, I could have a thousand of them. Awesome. Uh, so VNet, for those who aren't familiar with Azure, it, it stands for virtual networking. Uh, as you can imagine, you typically only want to have a you know a single public entry point into your application with regards to all of your microservices and, and other connectivity. Everything else is hidden securely behind a, a virtu virtual networking. So all your services can talk to each other internally in Azure, but you only have that one kind of public uh, access point or an API gateway, which, which fronts everything securely for you. Uh, again, as I mentioned previously, app service is uh, language agnostic in, in some ways. So you can see here that we have .NET 5 support, .NET 6 will be coming. Uh, we've recently added the popular JBoss uh, application server for Java. Uh, so big Java enterprise applications, uh, JBoss is a very popular op option there as an example. Uh, talk a little bit about networking. So I'm not going to go into too much deep dive detail, but the, the key thing to take away here is that you can absolutely restrict what traffic comes into your application. You can filter it. You can decide what port you're going to have it come in via, et cetera, et cetera. Right? This is really important for securing your application. And here's the other one. Features that control the traffic from your application. So this is where a lot of, dare I say, accidental security mishaps do happen. So either developers or deployers do maybe, you know, uh, accidentally uh, do some log streaming on a port, which they forget to shut off. Or if you're a Java engineer, maybe you've left a JMX port open for debug that you shouldn't have, that sort of thing. So again, with Azure App Service Networking, you can make darn sure that none of that stuff leaks out to the public when it shouldn't do so. All right, um, I'm going to skip past this a little bit, um, except for just one important point here. When you deploy to app service, you can scale out to at least 100 in instances. Um, and we have a bunch of load balances and things at the front, you know, kind of as you'd expect. It's, it's a managed auto-scalable uh, service for you. 
this is a whole bunch of uh, extra detail, and I think Rory's going to go through much of this anyway, so I'm just going to skip past that. Right, so let's summarize and get on to the demo part. Um, there's migration tooling to help you. You can deploy from anywhere, whether it be from your IDE or from something like Jenkins or from your Docker Hub container registry. We're investing a ton into open source. So uh, I think Satcher, our CEO, said, uh, I think it was five, six years ago now that Microsoft is all in on open source and it continues to be true going forward. It's, it's one of the reasons why I personally joined Microsoft two years ago to hit up Java um, because I could see that you know they, they walk the talk uh, when it comes to open source now, uh, which has been fantastic to see. So things like JBoss has been added. Um, all the open uh, standards you'd expect, like open telemetry, have been added. Um, so it's really fantastic to see. Right, on to the main event. So Rory, let's let's get on to the demo piece, which is far more exciting. Okay, so um, for this demo, um, I'm going to take the PetClinic application, and I've got a, a simple version of that. You can see there, uh, and and I, in my day job, I actually do documentation. So. If you go onto the uh, aka dot, uh, aka dot ms forward slash Java uh, dash learn path, it's one of the links that we'll uh, we'll put up there. And um, in one of the uh, the learn paths that you get here, uh, there is a rapidly dev and deploy using uh, Terraform, rapidly develop and deploy job apps in GitHub Actions or Azure Pipelines. I'm going to show you what we do there, and because that's actually using uh, Azure DevOps or uh, GitHub Actions. I'm going to use GitHub Actions, and I'm going to show you how to get that. So I've cloned the project. Uh, you you can actually just, uh, you can see there, it's actually uh, cloned the project. Uh, I forked it off there. And then you've got the project here. So I'm going to show you this, but I did promise Martin I'm going to show you GitHub Code Spaces. I'm going to open up there. I'm going to go New Code Spaces. So I'm running the beta of Code Spaces, but if you've got a Teams or organization, you get it also, and uh, then they'll price according there. And, and it's pretty cheap. So you can go New Code Spaces here. And I'm going to show you the project according with uh, GitHub Code Spaces here. So it's starting up. It's going to start it up with a four core CPU. Uh, eight gigs of RAM, um, and I can also open this code space in VS Code Desktop if uh, if I wanted to. Also, now normally when it starts up with code space, it opens up in light mode. It just lets you edit it, which is the same as what uh, Martin said there. Uh, you can do the dot at the end of the name, and it just opens it up in a, a in a basic editor. I really do want dark mode there. Uh, mark done. Uh, choose the look uh, you want there. Uh, I don't want to do that. Just mark done there. Um, and then you can you can see that it'll start setting up uh, Java. You can configure the runtime there. So in this project here, let's make this a little bit bigger. I've got an Azure DevOps folder. Now we're not going to go through Azure DevOps here, but I've got a GitHub folder, which is GitHub Actions, and then I've got a Terraform folder. So if I go into the Terraform folder, there's my Terraform files, my main.tf outputs and variables. And then if I go into the GitHub Action folder here, I've already set up my GitHub Actions, which, I, uh, which I'm going to show you. I'm going to push it live on air, and hopefully everything's going to go, uh, go well with uh, that. So let's go look at the main.terraform here. Uh, I'm going to close that there. And then the main.tf file here, um, it, uh, no, I do not want to install that right now. Uh, it just sets up an Azure app service. So you can see there uh, it's uh, setting up a resource manager. It, then it's going to set up a MySQL server, creates a MySQL server. Uh, it puts some firewall ports so to allow your app service to connect to uh, your MySQ uh, MySQL database. It creates an app service plan, uh, the actual physical app service. And then some variables there to bind to your uh, your database, to your Spring port there. So in that example there, I'm going to create a Spring uh, profile, uh, MySQL profile, and then I'm going to uh, set it as app service variables for the database username, password, and uh, URL. So that's Terraform. Now, how do I actually run that in uh, in, in GitHub Actions? So I've got a, a little main.yaml there. Um, and in, in there, uh, I just go Terraform init plan and apply. So I'm not really changing much of the Terraform workflow. I'm just saying that when you run the GitHub workflow there, and I'm not going to provision my resources right now, because I already saw that it takes about five minutes. But I've got another uh, Terraform uh, flow. And this was generated off the deployment center here. And this actually goes and builds my project from Maven. It then uh, takes the uh, built uh, jar file. It uh, puts it into the workspace into GitHub. And then it deploys it with a secret that I have in the app service profile. Um, and this is executed on, on push. So over here, I'm not going to execute the, the Terraform provisioning. So let's let's go and change that 
I'm all, all I'm going to do on my readme.md here, I'm just going to change there. Uh, Rory's, uh, Rory's uh, sp uh, Spring Prep Clinic with GitHub Actions and that. And now I should be able to go in here and now I'm going to push that. So if I go here, uh, Rory's commit, and I'm going to commit that. And remember, this is in code space. This isn't Visual Studio Code. This is in code spaces. And I'm going to go push. Now, th this will trigger the GitHub action uh, to, and I can go see that GitHub action there. Uh, I want to go into my uh, GitHub uh, account, github.com forward slash Rory P. And I want to go into that little uh, MS Learn simplified here. Now, I should be able to see the GitHub action being triggered. So if I go into GitHub actions here, there it is, Rory's commit. And it's it's busy committing in there. It's busy building it with that uh, the Maven build there. You can see build with Maven. It's going to download a lot of a Maven dependencies. Remember what I said about Gradle? Gradle is so much quicker than this because this is downloading all of those Maven dependencies. We spoke to the, the Gradle team. We spoke to the, the GitHub team. They helped us. And, and now when you do uh, GitHub starters, you can actually use, uh, sorry, DevOps starters on Azure Portal. You can actually use uh, Gradle. Um, so this is building uh, with uh, Maven. It's going to take a jar file, and if I just minimize that there, uh, it's going to upload that artifact for the deployment job, and this is built into two different jobs. You can see there, uh, if I go back into my actions here, there is a uh, build job, and then there's going to be a deploy job. So it gets that build, and it's, it's kind of like a sidecar container, if you're familiar with Kubernetes. Gets that uh, that uh, jar, builds it, and then uh, deploys it to your Azure App Service. Now, I have created that Azure App Service before, um, and it is in the Marmot one, uh, because I actually have to have a MySQL database. So we're going to look at exactly some of the features for that App Service uh, once that's completed, and we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that there. So let's go look at uh, exactly what I do uh, uh, once that is there. So I've got the application here. You can see here's my app services. I've got the Marmite application. We're going to go back into there. Then I've got the Spring application and then my little backup application there. Uh, so in, this is the application here, uh, Spring RPZA. And in this application, it's an Azure app service uh, that I've set up and it's running on those beautiful, uh, they won't give me enough of them, P3 servers. Now the P3 servers are just magnificent. If I can, if I go in and, and you really want to scoop these up while there's uh, while there's few of them, uh, and you can see how beautiful they are when you go scale up. Uh, you can see there some of their features there, and we're going to use some of the features to see why uh, app services are so great. So you can see their P3 V3. I've got 32 gigabytes of RAM and eight CPUs. Um, and then I've got, you get uh, custom domain SSL access, order scale up to 30 uh, instances. You can get staging slots, uh, so deployment slots, daily backups, uh, traffic manager, and traffic manager is like the load balancer uh, from heaven. It's just so powerful. Uh, you get included hardware. Um, so let's look at some of those uh, features that you get uh, with the uh, app service there. And we'll eventually see uh, that little dot at the top that Rory's commit. It will come back to green. And then I'll know that my, my action is actually done, and then we can see uh, if it deployed. So maybe my deployment didn't work up, and I want to uh, go back on a, a backup. I can actually go back on that backup with uh, the built-in backups. Now, it, it does. You can force a, a backup, but it also clicks through, and every time you make a change, you can go and see a snapshot. So if I click on Restore, you can see that the snapshots are done. I haven't done this. Uh, this did it for me. And the snapshots are uh, from September 14, 13. I created this for the demo yesterday. And I can go back and actually go in and uh, and uh, restore back to a snapshot. That is brilliant. And that comes with the, the P versions, uh, definitely the P3 V3, uh, the premium versions of there. Or you can go and uh, do a manual backup or manual restore here. And you can even restore the configuration settings. If you do whack the configuration settings, which I've done so many times, you can actually restore uh, the configure, configure, uh, configurations. So that, that's backup. We do have application insights uh, built in uh, over there also. But now we're connecting to a MySQL database, uh, so not an H2 database. So this should actually show you MySQL stuff. Uh, so you can go in there, uh, and we can see the, uh, let's go in there, the application map. And exactly what we said there, I've created telemetry before that, maybe not in the last hour. Let's go in there in the last 48 hours, because I have done a lot of changes over this uh, in the, in, in the, the, the interim. Uh, there we go. And that's the MySQL database. And I can click on uh, that, and I can get all the view for the, the performance for, for all of that, the, the slowest request, 
uh, all of the requests that we saw in the previous section, or I can actually go in and click on my database and get a lot of database profiling there, investigate the performance, it comes through there, and I can go back and see the end-to-end -end transactions for my MySQL database. I've got 299 samples. I don't want to show you all of those. I just want to show you the uh, some of the, let's take the longest one. Whoa, some of these are 20, 27 milliseconds. Let's go here. And I can, I can drill down into each one of them and see the transaction there. I can see into the samples there. Uh, to the select statements there. So, so that's select pet type there. And I can get end-to-end -end transaction. And look how easy that is. Um, and that's that's that I didn't even set up in Terraform. That is just, I pushed it there, enabled application insights, and I've got my end-to-end -end transaction management here uh, that I can click through and, and, and go through that. So that's built into app service here. Let's go back here and see. Okay, so we're still on the build here. Is May, I think Maven downloads, oh, there we go. It, and then it finished the deploy. It just didn't update on my browser. Now when the, the deployment is done, it's got a deploy to Azure App Service here. And now it gives me the URL and I can just click through to the URL and I should see the pet clinic application. The difference is that you're not gonna know, but this is actually running my SQL in the background and it's, it was pushed with, uh, 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 with Terraform. So I can go find owner there. And I've got all of the same ownerships. So it's the exact same app, except we've uh, wired it with uh, a database. Now, how did we wire it? Remember the spring profile that I showed you? I'm just going to close all of that there. Uh, and I'm going to close uh, the, the code spaces. Thank you so much, code spaces. And the minute I close it, it just shuts itself down, doesn't charge me uh, anything more. So how did I wire that? If I go into my app services, the spring RPZA, and then I go into my configuration, you'll see there that now I've got some environment variables that uh, uh, that had the URL, the password, and a lot of the settings. Now, ideally, you can keep it there, and your administrator is the only person who can actually access there. You can see there, here's my database URL, and I can click on the hidden view, and I can see it there. But you can also put this in Key Vault. Now, if you put it in Key Vault, then you can get a, a like a hardware device uh, this is uh, this is a vape pen. It's not really a hardware device, but it's a it's it's a it's a symbolism for a, um, a hardware device. And then you can get a a, a multi-factor authentication that only them can actually access uh, whoever has that with that. And you can set that up in uh, identity with uh, Key Vault here, and you can um, remove all of those settings there and, and do that though. So that that is uh, configuration and how we actually connected to uh, that MySQL uh, database. The other thing I want to show you, and uh, I want to start off with the, this discussion, but I want to really want to show it in the next section, is how to scale up and scale out. So scale up, we saw there that uh, the P3 V3 service, so you, you can go in there and you can uh, upgrade that. Uh, there's even a free tier, so you can go to uh, free tier, so it has 60 minutes or uh, one gigabyte of memory, or the B1, the burstable one, so they actually save in uh, their compute, and when you need it, need it, it actually uh, Bursts it out there, but for production we recommend the uh, P versions there, and also we have the S uh, versions there for that. And you get a lot of features there, uh, like I showed you. You get traffic manager, you get daily backups, uh, staging slots, auto scale, and and traffic manager is pretty simple to set up. Um, I'm not going to set it up here, but you can actually front it and go to different CDNs, content delivery networks for your applications with traffic manager, and it's built in uh, to support there. You can also use the isolated, and Martin did touch on that. Now, the isolated is if you want to have a VNet, a virtual network, and an isolated uh, take on, and you can use the apps, uh, app service version three services there. You can have an entire environment now, and you don't have to worry about your database talking to your app service, talking to uh, your built-in file stores, it's all contained in your isolated VNet uh, for your V3 uh, services here. So this is really new. It only went GA like a, a few weeks ago. I, I really am really impressed with the product team. They did such a great job. But you want to uh, create an isolated VNet there, and then you have end-to-end -end encryption and, and uh, uh, kind of lockdown of your network there, um, and includes your app service uh, tiering, um, and uh, pricing is pretty uh, pretty reasonable. So let's look at scale out. And this is uh, where uh, the cloud really comes in there. So you can scale up manual scale. You can scale out to uh, up to, uh, uh, let's make, let's see there. Uh, let's see how many scale instances there. Uh, let's make that even smaller then. And uh, let me minimize that. Uh, let's see how many I can go to. Da, da, da. Uh, it's so big that I can't even see it. Let's uh, make it a little bit smaller. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, okay, well, 
it's, it's two it's 300 instances there so I, I can't see that there for some reason uh but it's 300 uh, instances there, manual scale but i can also do custom order scale now i want to scale if my cpu goes ab ab below a, a certain level i want to add a metric there uh, to see what it is now uh what what is my cpu currently on i can go into application insights and I can go see what my CPU is. So let's see what the CPU currently is. It should be idling uh, at about like two, three percent. But on high load, like uh, Black Friday, I might actually have. Uh, uh, let's go there. Server requests availability. I want to go uh, live metrics, and I want to say, okay, cool. Never go uh, below ten percent. Ten percent is high CPU for a web server. So it'll connect to you uh, there, and I can go. Okay, cool. What is uh, the CPU for my instance there. You can see at the bottom there, I've got uh, the CPU total, and it's it's not even it's not even f f figuring there. It's and it's like zero percent. It's not even being used though. Uh, but I can actually say, uh, let's go back to application insights and go. Uh, if it hits uh, more than ten percent, please go in and scan at order scale. So let's go back into here. Let's go into scale out, which is uh, I want more of my servers. So I can go custom order scale. Now it is connecting to a database, so which is great. I can scale more of them, and they'll just connect to the same database because all I'm doing is I'm scaling the same instance. So I want to say, okay, cool, scale in a metric, and I want to go add a rule. Uh, you can also do a scale in a schedule. Uh, um, I'm going to go add a rule, and uh, the rule says that uh, when I go above 10% uh, uh, of CPU, so I want to go not my current resource, not the Azure plan. I want to go other resources. Uh, and then uh, I want to go uh, app services, uh, select a resource. I want to do that one that I had there. That's great. Uh, and I want to say then when the uh, CPU time is greater than 10%, so you can see there that's the only CPU one there, when uh, the, the average, uh, let's just find that. And you can also search for it there. So the CPU time, um, and it's, it's currently, okay, again, it's not the CPU time. I wanted... App service standard metrics. I just want CPU, uh, file system usage, health count, HTTP. Um, I actually think I missed uh, just missed it. The thread count. I want to go. Uh, there we go. Uh, so I want to go back to the current resource here. Um, and uh, yeah, there was. <laughs> I actually went into the secret stash of more metrics uh, that I showed you there. That's how you get into all of the metrics. So the CPU percentage. Uh, you can see it only scaled up when we actually went in there, uh, but it hit nine percent there. So I can actually go in there and say, cool, uh, when you are uh, um, uh, average higher than 10%, uh, uh, let's say greater than 10%, uh, 10% uh, there, uh, if you are greater than 10% for a minute, um, then please uh, go increase the count of the servers uh, uh, and don't wait, buy one. Uh, and I can go there. And I can say, okay, cool, I like that. Go add, uh, and um, I'm going to say maximum of three servers there. Um, but then, what happens if I if I, I add, if the CPU goes down? I want to add a scale setting there to go downwards uh, to to actually lower it because I, I don't want to pay for things that I don't want to use. So uh, I've got CPU percentage there. So less than or equal to ten. Uh, ten, and then I I can go there duration. I don't want to do it uh, wait too long. Cool down. I don't want to wait too long. And then decrease uh, decrease uh, count to one. So now it's going to increase slowly up to three. Uh, you can see there uh, um, when um, when I want to uh, scale up, increase by, count by one. Um, and then uh, scale in when the CPU is less than ten, in, decrease count to one. So I save that there. I've got auto scaling. Now I can scale up up to 300 instances if I wanted to. Um, and now I can uh, um, be sure that when my CPU goes to a certain level and Black Friday comes, I'll scale up to a certain degree. And then when I don't need to, I'll scale down. Now that makes a lot of sense also with microservices. And that's a nice little segue into the next section that we have. We're going to take Q&As here. This is what I wanted to show you with this demo here. So I pushed it with Terraform. I showed you with GitHub Actions. I opened it with Code Spaces, And I showed you how to manuals, uh, manual scale and custom order scale backups and also uh, distributed uh, tracing. Back to you, Martin. Well, uh, thanks again for a fantastic uh, fast demo, and it's good to see the full the full stack end to end, right? Terraform or Ansible or Puppet or Chef or whatever is your weapon of choice when it comes to, to your DevOps uh, scripting. Um, 
you know, all the way through to monitoring mm -hmm. that in, in production uh, at, at the very end is, is, is very cool to see. Um, and I think one of the key takeaways, again, when you're moving from kind of monolith to cloud native services is, is that monitoring is absolutely critical. It is uh, far more challenging when you're trying to you know, trace your transactions across multiple microservices. Um, and also when you're in, an, dare I say, an unfamiliar environment to begin with, right? You're inside a, a VNet, um, your data store isn't sitting on the on the server in the, in the, in the, in the rack downstairs. Right, it's it's sitting somewhere in, in the cloud, of course. Um, so having that monitoring and having that ability to trace things through, we, you know, we we turn that whole uh, area of observability is is really really important. Um, so just as a reminder, please do keep asking your questions uh, throughout the session, and you know, obviously, if they're related to whatever Rory or I are talking about at the time, great. Uh, if there's just another question you have that you're curious about Microsoft uh, and Java in particular, uh, whether you are a .NET developer primarily or you're a Java developer, uh, please please fire away. Um, so I'll swap across to our question section, and I will uh, put poor old Rory through 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 some tests again. It's, it's like being back at school, Rory. Right, so let's see if I can find the first one here. First one I've got here actually is around Custo logs for uh, really, I guess, querying of application logs and things. So is there an SDK for this in Java or .NET? I'm not sure if there's an SDK. Um, in the next session that we have, I'm going to show you how to access Custo logs for that. Um, now, the Custo logs are just uh, log uh, well, they're just a SQL query to view uh, events in your log view, though. Um, so I'm quite sure it is possible, uh, but I can't say categorically that we can have an SDK. Now, let's wait for the demo, the next demo. I think we're going to jump ahead there, and I'm going to show you some nice Custo queries on the Azure Spring Cloud, and we can see uh, how that works. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Rory. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll follow up uh, afterwards, and we'll, we'll see if we can find out whether there's an SDK or not. I, I actually suspect there is. It's such a common... Uh, task that that uh, folks who are deployers of, of applications to to Azure uh, would, would need to do. So I wouldn't be surprised at all if, if the Azure SDK supports this. Um, next question I have here is around the latency of application insights. And, and I'm going to paraphrase this. I think what the audience member is asking is, you know, what is the impact of application insights on a running application? And I, 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 I have, a, you I have, have a very good, good I have a very good example of what not to do in a live demo. Uh, so I did a live demo in front, in front of a Java user group. And what I did is that I, I, I pushed a million transactions onto my uh, app service. And then I said, hey, let's go check the distributed tracing. And the funnel was so big that I actually had to wait about half an hour to get that. So it really depends on the funnel that you're, you're using uh, in that sense, though. But there is an SLA linked to application insights. So we actually have an SLA linked to it. Um, and depending on the service, the SLA will actually cover certain services to make sure that you do have that distributed tracing. By default, um, in my experience, it's about two to three minutes uh, for uh, most of the distributed tracing. MySQL, it's, it takes a little bit long, longer, especially if you do like uh, uh, slow query logs or long range queries, then it can take up to uh, 15 minutes uh, to get there. Though. But we, we do have an SLA. So if it takes too long, the, the real answer is that you can get on the line and you can say, Microsoft, uh, you're taking too long, fix it, which is which is great news. Back to you, Mont. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Um, I'll also cover the, the actual impact of running application insights, uh, the, the agents uh, on, on your JVM, so on Java or for .NET on, on the CLR. So it, it is fairly lightweight as an open telemetry agent. Um, it, it will automatically, uh, you know, trace your H, basically your HTTP and your, your database calls. Um, we've worked very hard internally with um, uh, engineers, uh, a guy called Trask actually, uh, who's who's kind of fairly well known in the Java industry for uh, a tool that he he had written some time ago called Glowroot, uh, which was a very highly performant way of doing this kind of uh, distributed transaction tracing in the JVM. Uh, so we, we're, we're getting it down, we continue to work on it, um, but it has, it has a pretty low overhead um, we certainly know that you know when you ask it to do a Java flight recording, which is probably the most intensive thing it, 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 you can ask it to do it on, on demand, is about a 2% overhead uh, when you ask it for the Java flight recording. Um, so it's, it's very lightweight. It shouldn't really negatively impact uh, your running service uh, in, in any way, shape, or form. 
Uh, the next question I have here is what's the, basically what's the difference between Azure Functions and Azure App Service plans? Um, so that's, well, no, that's a huge yeah. difference. Um, huge difference. So, yeah. so Azure Functions are your cross-cutting concern to do a lot of operational things that you don't necessarily want to do on App Service. So, for example, if you've got some compliance features, you want to make sure you uh, do some logging or send it to a third-party system, you'll do that in an Azure function. They're very quick to load, uh, and they're cheap. Uh, they're built by execution time, and they're, they're built in their millions. Um, and, uh, and as a result, they're not really, you don't care about them. Uh, they just, uh, they, they get created, and then they go away. They're event-driven, so they're, they're driven by an event. Azure App Service really is your baby. You want to you want to keep it nice. You want to keep it warm, um, and you want to you want to keep it uh, healthy and happy. So Azure Functions are really for your serverless functions, your event-driven architecture, and then your App Service uh, is your 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 mainstay and your App Service isolated plans, your app service environment, that is really a business. Uh, you can run your entire company in an app service plan, and, and it's self-contained in there. You've got VNet, so you can actually connect to your, your downstream systems, uh, use your point-to-point -point networking into your hybrid networks, though. So that's the difference between the two of them. Awesome. Thank you, Rory. Uh, so that's the last of the questions we got stacked up for now. I think we're going to take another short break, and Adam will tell us how, how much time we get. I think we've clawed back a little bit of time, th th thankfully. Uh, and I appreciate we're cutting to lunchtime for some of you as well. So this is a good opportunity to grab a snack, grab a drink. And, you uh, don't want to miss the next one. Azure, Azure Spring Cloud is incredible. We're going to take the Spring Boot application, and we're going to break it up into microservices. So you really don't want to miss the next one. So we've got a five minute break. Yeah, we've got a five minute break coming up. Um, we're going to watch a couple of the other sustainability videos brought to us by Asim Hussein, who's the cloud advocate. And then we'll be back with a final half hour on Spring Cloud. So see you in five minutes. Awesome. Thanks. We'll see you soon. So I've mentioned before that electricity is dirty, but how dirty is it? Well, it depends on where it was made. If it was made in a fossil fuel power plant, like a, a coal power plant, then it's gonna be quite dirty. If it was made in a renewables plant, like a, a wind or a solar farm, then it's gonna be quite clean. And this measure of how dirty your electricity is, is called carbon intensity. And all electricity has this number. The electricity coming through your wall socket right now has this number. And it changes by region. If you're in a region where most of electricity is created through coal power plants, your carbon intensity is going to be high. If you're in a region where most of your electricity is created by renewable power plants, your carbon intensity is going to be lower. But it also interestingly changes over time as well. When the wind's blowing or the sun's shining, then it means that there's more energy being created through renewable plants, which means that your carbon intensity is lower. But when the wind stops blowing or the sun isn't shining, utilities have to make up the difference by burning more coal or burning more gas, which increases the carbon intensity. And that's why carbon intensity is the third principle of sustainable software engineering. Consume electricity with the lowest carbon intensity possible, which leads to a really, really interesting use case, which is called demand shifting. Try running your workloads at times or in regions where the carbon intensity is less. And what's really exciting about this approach is that without changing a single line of code, just by making a decision about when and where you're going to run your application, you can reduce the carbon emissions of your application. Demand shifting is the strategy of moving workloads to regions or times when resources are constrained. Demand shaping is a similar strategy, but instead of moving uh, demand to a different region or time where there are enough resources, we shape our demand to match existing supply. If the supply that we're talking about is electricity, then whatever renewable energy is available right now, we change our application so that's all it uses. It's a really subtle concept, but I think a really interesting one and leads to some really amazing ideas for architects and designers. A great example of this is video conferencing. Rather than streaming at the highest quality possible at all times, when bandwidth is low, when this resource is constrained, they often shape the demand by reducing the video quality and prioritizing audio instead. 
Another example of this is progressive enhancement for the web. The web experience improves depending on the resources and bandwidth available to end, the end user's device. And this whole thing is linked to this broader concept in sustainability, which is all about reducing consumption. We can achieve a lot by being more efficient with resources, but at some point, we're just going to have to consume less. As sustainable software engineers, to be carbon efficient means perhaps at times when the carbon intensity is high, instead of moving a workload to another less carbon intensive region, we just cancel it. We reduce the demands of our application and the expectations of our end users for a bit. That's why the seventh principle of sustainable software engineering is demand shaping. Instead of shaping supply to match demand, try shaping demand to match supply. Hi everyone, welcome back to Tech Days. This is uh, Adam speaking. So um, if you if you found those videos interesting on sustainable software engineering, um, there are a couple of interesting resources. So first of all, um, if you go to channel nine, you can actually find that entire series as part of One Dev Minute. There's actually about six or seven different videos from Asim. Um, and also on Microsoft Learn, and we'll bring the link up in a little while, there's a sustainable software engineering learning path. So you can actually learn all about that. Um, but obviously, you're here to find out more about Java. And I think Rory and Martin are back in place. So we're going to head back over to there for the last session, which is on Spring Cloud. And just a reminder, uh, please keep your live Q&A coming. Um, we'll answer it um, either via the chat or uh, Rory and Martin will answer it um, themselves. Um, so now back to Rory and Martin. Martin, Hello. what do we have to what do we have to show them now? Because um, like I, I, I've I've really pulled a rabbit out of the head. I've showed them Copilot, Code Spaces, distributed tracing. We can't get better than this. Uh, you know, there, there can't be a better service than App Service out there. Uh, I, I think there's one very very popular one that we we can show. So obviously, Spring Spring Framework, Spring Cloud, Spring Boot is um, you know a pretty dominant force in the Java industry. Uh, it's allowed people to build microservices uh, really rapidly. It's a programming model that uh, I suspect many folks who are listening in are very familiar with. Um, and so we decided to go support you with a first class uh, citizen uh, in Azure, like a, a full PaaS for, just for Spring and Spring alone. Um, so let me bring up the slide deck on that quickly. And I'll, I'll do what I did last time. I'll whip through the slides as quickly as I can, because quite frankly, most of you here are developers and you actually want to see the code and and not PowerPoint slides. You've seen enough of those in your life. Um, let me see if I can get this to work. So platform start. Here we go. Girl, screen share again. I was about to say, Rory, the technology today with StreamYard and things has actually been working quite nicely. Knock on wood. If if you uh, don't use Chrome while doing that, like I said to you, like I, I, in front of thousands of people, I went and closed all my browser windows going, ah, oh, no, close, 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 close. And I go, why did the session go so quiet suddenly? <laughs> At least you didn't show them your bank details, Rory. That's, that's the important thing. You've done that? Uh, cl very close to it, yes. Yes, <laughs> certainly have. Um, all right. Hopefully folks can see that slide deck there. All right, we've already talked about Rory. We know, oh, actually, there's an important one. On the right-hand side there, Java at Microsoft. That's our Twitter handle, and that's where you'll see all of the news and all of the insights that we have uh, about Java as it pertains to the entirety of the Microsoft family. So you'll see us occasionally tweeting about, you know, uh, initiatives at Mojang for Minecraft, um, things that might be happening at LinkedIn, uh, open source projects that we're donating to or even helping run, uh, things like Eclipse Adoption, formerly Adopt Open JDK, which is... Uh, probably the world's most popular uh, Open JDK distribution. Uh, free is in beer and free is in use. Uh, and that's something that Microsoft actually sponsors at a strategic level. And we have our engineers working there full time to make sure that's available to you um, going forward, as an example. So let's talk a little bit about Spring. For those of you who are uh, a little bit longer in the tooth, like uh, Rory and myself, dare I say. Um, let me just scroll this a little bit further. Let me go back. Apologies. Here we go. Uh, we'll remember the bad old days of very early Java 
EE or Java, J2EE back in the days. Uh, and in those days, Rory, can you remember if you had to write an enterprise Java bean, how many classes did you have to write just to say hello world? Six a minimum, nine uh, if you really wanted to get stuff done. You had to have a remote, you had to have a uh, local, then you had to have a, uh, a session bean, an entity bean, a local remote entity bean, uh, basically nine classes. And, uh, you know, you had to kind of understand Corba interfacing also. So uh, all in all, uh, it took you a couple of weeks to write a, a basic uh, a service. Hello, yeah, no, exactly. So Spring kind of revolutionized that about 10 years ago, if not longer now, actually. Uh, and it's continued to evolve since. And now we have Spring Boot and Spring Cloud. And Spring Boot in particular is, is the way that folks love to spin up services. And so we thought at Microsoft, how can we supercharge that, right? We know people love to build Spring Boot applications, um, but they still have this challenge that they have to go and deploy it themselves, run it on Kubernetes manually, uh, all these kind of things, right? So. Nope, 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 we don't want to do that. We want to help you, the developer, get your Spring microservices uh, up and running in production as quickly as possible. So uh, we have people like Rory who go build uh, wonderful microservices, uh, Spring Pet Clinic being the, the classic demo example that we love, love to use today. Um, and of course, there's a whole bunch of management and orchestration which needs to happen for those services. So. Again, you can choose to do this yourself. You can use Kubernetes or Docker Compose or all these kind of things. But unless you really enjoy that sort of stuff, it's better to have you know someone else do that for you. And that's that's what we provide with, with Spring Service. Of course, you want to have an API gateway in front of things. We talked about that before a little bit with things like the VNet. So we put a public API gateway in front to make sure that's orchestrated for you. You then go and run that all in the cloud, and here we go. You can see all the microservices all bouncing away in there, talking to each other inside that VNet. Um, again, with Azure Spring Cloud, you do not need to go and set up all of this auto scaling or Kubernetes or any of that stuff at all. Uh, it just all happens under the hood for you. As you'd expect, uh, with 12 factor applications, we like to call them, or uh, cloud native applications, you need to have things like the service registry so you can find all these microservices. Uh, you need to have a configuration service set up and the distributed tracing that Rory showed before, which is absolutely critical because you, you do not want to lose where that important business transaction went. So again, we provided all those first class services in Azure Spring Cloud. All right, so we'll go past this. Kubernetes, uh, we've talked about how complex this is and there's our good friend YAML. It actually says YAMI in there. That's a great typo. Bruno's going <laughs> to love that. <laughs> Fantastic. So. Don't want to do all that. This is what happens un under the hood uh, in Spring Cloud, but no, we're not going to want to do that manually. Instead, we just have to show you this kind of view, right? You care about your microservices. Kubernetes does the orchestration under the hood for you, but you don't have to touch kubectl or any other thing like that. All right, so that's Spring Cloud. Uh, much like App Service, you can deploy to it any which way you like. Uh, you can use Azure DevOps. You can use GitHub Actions, your favorite CI CD pipeline. Jenkins is a popular choice with Java. Command line, you know, WSL people mentioned before. Yep, you can use the uh, Azure SDK from your WSL command line on your Windows uh, and your Surface Book Pro. Fire that away. Happy days. And you can do all your monitoring. So Azure Monitor is our overarching um, monitoring stack. As part of Azure Monitor, you have application insights. You also have this thing called container insights. So you can uh, see what's going on at the container level, as an example. Very importantly, on the top right-hand corner there, Azure Active Directory. Of course, these days, we need to make absolutely sure that you've got role-based authentication and authorization going on. You don't just want any, any old person accessing those valuable admin screens that you may have. Um, so can scale the services. Rory spoke before here about Black Friday, so a little bit of history uh, about me. So. Uh, I used to be the CEO of a company called J Clarity, um, and uh, we had uh, we did application performance management tooling. We used machine learning to figure out why JVMs were going slow. And the reason why we got into that that space was because of Black Friday. Uh, we had a bunch of customers who had to put up virtual queues. So you'd go to the website and they would say, "You are being held in a virtual queue for two minutes." Uh, because they couldn't scale their architecture, right? And so they had to queue up users outside of their website. Um, and they lost, you know, some of these big companies lost millions of dollars per minute um, because they weren't able to get customers on, onto their sites. Um, 
so yeah so happily i came to microsoft in 2019 as part of the acquisition and uh, this is definitely one of the things that uh, i enjoy working on in azure that we can solve this problem for you right so we need uh the business strategy of being able to do this much faster uh, that's all marketing stuff we'll skip past there all right what do i need to do so obviously when before we have black friday we don't need to have you know or on weekends when people are shopping a little bit less, we can scale down, right? Scale down to a single instance. Maybe during the holiday season, we can override those defaults um, and scale up, especially on those Black Friday or Cyber Monday style days. Uh, Christmas Eve, uh, Eve is also another popular one in, in the Western world in particular. All right. So we have here the ability to auto scale, and you can auto scale on a whole bunch of different metrics. Um, Rory's going to show you a, a couple of these as we go. Um, but you can do it on, for example, the number of user sessions or user requests that are coming in. Uh, you can base it on some sort of resource characteristics, such as CPU or memory utilization, uh, so on and so forth. So you can really fine tune this to exactly how your customers and how your users uh, use your, your service in production. Very helpful. Um, more auto scaling settings. It's more important to see this in the demo than just to see screenshots on the slides. So we'll skip past that. And sure enough, here we are, back to good old Spring Pet Clinic with the cutest little animals on there. Um, so I'll hand over back to you, Rory, and uh, you can show Azure Spring Cloud live to the audience. So we're going to take the Spring Pet Clinic application. Now, another one of those learn paths, the aka.ms forward slash Java dash learn path, uh, shows you how to use uh, monitoring and uh, does the Spring Pet Clinic uh, in microservices. So uh, right at the bottom of the Java Learn Path, I just finished it, um, you can go and access that. Uh, so uh, I'm going to show you uh, my Visual Studio Code. And now Visual Studio Code is our friend. Um, and uh, we, we love Visual Studio Code because we already see that you can do so much with it. Now I've got the application. And this application is stored. Let me ask uh, Chrome. Where did Chrome? I, I love opening Chrome with... Uh, uh, with um, uh, StreamYard. I never know where it opens. So if you want to go here, now we can go into, let's try it and search for uh, Rory P forward slash spring. Uh, let's go to microservices. So we want to go um, microservices. Let's see what happens there. I love it. I just popped it in there and it just finds it there. So this is the Azure samples uh, forward slash uh, spring picnic microservices. And you can see that it's, it's, it's well maintained. And in it there, we've got our admin server, our API gateway, our config server, customer service, discovery server, vet service, and visit service. Now, these are the spring Netflix OSS stack uh, kind of configuration for your, your uh, microservices. If you don't know the Netflix OSS stack, uh, Spring Cloud was built originally on Netflix OSS. Now, Netflix had a really nice scalable idea called uh, Circuit Breaker. Now, if you've used Netbrick, Net, Netflix, Netflix, you have like a banner there. And in that banner, you have all of your little shows that you watch. Now, their, 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 their mission statement is to show them something all the time. So it scales according to your bandwidth. So you can get 4K or just a, a little banner there. And how it does that, it actually uses circuit breaker to say you're overwhelming or you're underwhelming the client and using back pressure to say uh, push more uh, pressure uh, through push more data through from the client side through to the server. So the server side and the client side talk at the same time. So this is really what it's based on. And uh, at the same time, when a microservice comes up, it's going to take it into that registry. It's going to uh, register itself there. And uh, then it's going to uh, say to everyone, hey, I'm up. So let's go through those services, and then I'll, I'll show you how I pushed it there, and we'll go through some of the nice features for uh, Azure Spring Cloud. Uh, okay, so let's go here. So the first thing I want to show you is where's the config for all of this? Now, the config is actually stored uh, externally in an Azure Spring Cloud uh, service, but you do need a config server. So the config server pulls all the YAML uh, through to it, and then it actually gets all of that YAML and uh, processes it. So uh, if let me go find... Uh, my config. And now you can set up your config on your portal for your Azure Spring Cloud instance. So I have actually gone in uh, and created an Azure Spring Cloud instance with that uh, those Spring Pet Clinic uh, application. Now the Pet Clinic application looks exactly like uh, the other application. I'm not going to demo it just yet. Um, but uh, if I go to Azure Spring Cloud, I want to show you the config server here. And I've got the, and I've called this booster RPZA because I really want a booster shot. I'm double back vaccinated. <laughs> I'm in South Africa, so we're going to wait a long time. So this is my booster shot that I'm giving myself, though, booster RPZA. And uh, on my config server here, 
uh, you'll see there that I'm uh, linking through to a, a specific config here, and it's on the Azure samples. Uh, let me just show you there. Uh, Spring Pet Connect Microservice Config. And I've got all my config here, and I can see the customer service, the discovery service, the tracing service, all of that. I can go into custom service, and I can see there I've got uh, uh, the, the actual profile that I want to use, the, the Eureka, so the re registry instance there. But the more advanced services here, if I go to the gateway service, uh, let's go gateway, I can see there I've got my load balancing setup, and then I've also got my roots. So when I hit customer service, it's going to go uh, where it's going to supposed to go there. And then I've also set up here uh, uh, and compression, mom types, um, and then also I've got Zool, which is a, a load balance. I can do a lot of the Netflix OSS stack from the config. So that's my config that I've set up. Uh, once I have my config, then I'm going to forward all of my uh, sessions uh, through my load balancer with my API gateway. API gateway is just an, a, a simple little, uh, let's go here into apps. It's a, it's a simple little load balancer here. Um, you can click through here. And I've got one instance there that is running the API gateway. You can't have more than really one instance, though, because uh, it, it, uh, it it kind of uh, it takes in those instances for the HTTP. And I can access my API gateway through my public endpoint. And that's really your endpoint to access the application. So I can click through that. It's going to open there. And there's my pet clinic application. And I've got my owners here. And this is calling microservices now. So if I, you see all see how quick that was. I can go to George Franklin, uh, edit, uh, edit that, and submit it super fast and super performant. Uh, I'm going to add a little bit of telemetry here, and we'll see if we can get that telemetry to show uh, with uh, distributed tracing there. Uh, so, okay, so I've added a little bit of the telemetry uh, and a uh, little bit more. Um, okay, so let's go back. Let me close that there. So that's my 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 endpoint, and I've got all of my uh, my uh, there. Now I can go into some of the services. I'm not going to go there for uh, the API uh, gateway. What I want to show you is the customer service. So in my uh, little code here, uh, I've got the customer service. Now the customer service here is uh, got a source folder, and it's got your your normal Spring applications here, and it's got a JPA. Uh, object there that's going to pull for my MySQL database. So in my model here, I've got the owners, I've got the pets, like we saw in the, the first example here. I've got an owner repository that is going to, let me make that bigger there, close that, uh, that extends the JPA repository. And re remember, no mention of JPA, uh, of MySQL, because what we do is we actually use Spring idiomatic libraries called Spring Starters, and then we bind the, the type of database to that at runtime. So uh, Microsoft and Pivotal actually maintain those libraries. So everything that you want to do for your downstream dependencies, we have a library there. You don't even know that you're speaking to MySQL uh, right now. Um, and then you've got your uh, actual customer service here, and that's going to bind there. It's going to enable your discovery client. So as the service comes up, it's going to say, I'm a customer service. Eureka, please register me, and then go in and uh, tell the other services that I'm available. And then it's got a Spring Boot application uh, there. So that's my customer service. Now, I wanna, what, I, what I want to show you is that uh, I'm going to show you some of the features for Azure Spring Cloud. Let's just uh, minimize that there. Now, I can access my customer service directly through, and, and, and I've hacked it a little bit. So I want to show you the, the customer service here. So if I go to apps uh, and I go to customer service, and uh, you see there's a... Uh, 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 Let's go here. There's a test endpoint here, but I know that there's a, a there's a hack that I can do. So I can go into there and I can go. Okay, what is my API gateway that I chose there? So I can go uh, booster RPZ API gateway and then uh, owners. But I don't want to do that. I want to go uh, customers API there. So now I can pull the whole database, really, all the customers that I've got there in 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 XML format. That's great and all, um, but uh, that was a lot of data that I, I get here in, in, in all of the customers. And that's via the REST service with that uh, controller there. That's that's great. I'm going to now hit that with a million transactions. So let's let's do this live. I'm going to hit that with a million transactions. And while doing that, I'm going to do failover to a, another deployment slot uh, live on air. And let's, let's see what happens. I like to break stuff. So let's see if yeah. Azure Spring Cloud can actually cater for that. Um, yeah, and a Martin, yeah, Martin's probably going like, oh my gosh. I've only done this once. It's only failed once. So let, let's see what, uh, what, what we have there. So on my uh, application here for my app instances for customer service, you see there I've got two gigs of memory. And I've got, uh, uh, sorry, two CPUs and four gigs of memory. And I can scale that up uh, quite quite a lot uh, and each one of those instances here. But I've got two instances running. So I've got two customer instances currently running. Um, and you can scale out 
uh, with, uh, and we, we touched on that a little bit too, or a manual scale or custom auto scale. And the custom auto scale can go to uh, a, a few of the settings there. Uh, you can actually go into uh, add a rule here. You can scale onto app, app CPU uh, uh, usage. Uh, you can even scale into the Tomcat sessions. There's a lot of metrics you can actually do on that. I'm not going to set up auto scale because auto scaling takes about six minutes to actually scale up. Um, and I've done a lot of demos in there. You can go check my YouTube channel for that. Um, but uh, we're going to go see uh, on customer service here. I'm going to open up a load balance. And this load balance is a little script that I ran uh, that I did here. So I'm going to go into that uh, that little load balancer here and, uh, and called my SH script here. Um, I'm going to go a little bit under eager. I'm just going to uh, do a million transactions. I'm going to just, normally I do 4 million. I'm just going to make it a million this time. Uh, so let's open up Cloud Shell and uh, let's edit that Cloud Script. And then when I, I hit it, I'm going to show you that I don't lose one transaction because this is really Kubernetes in the, uh, in the background. And I want to show you the power of Kubernetes uh, and uh, with uh, Spring uh, services. So I'm going to go code and I've got a little script here that I run. Um, and uh, I've got uh, uh, a million transactions. I think that's a million. Uh, yeah, a million transactions. And I just want to take a few of those uh, off there because uh, I don't actually want to run four million transactions. And then it's going to call the booster app there, the, the booster service and the customer owners. And then it's going to append the date at the end of it just to make sure that it doesn't cache it. And I'm going to do cache no control also there. So save that there. And close that, close editor. You know, like I said, I, I work in the, the internet. And then I'm going to sh script dot, uh, uh, script dot sh, boom. And that's going to do a million transactions. OK, so now that we're putting load onto the transaction, uh, before we do the failover and show you how to do deployment slots, I can actually see what's happening real time with real time metrics. So let's, if we, if we uh, minimize that for a second, I can go back into my Spring Cloud instance here. And now we're, 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 uh, we can go into our application insights for our distributed tracing. And uh, I can see my application map. Uh, I can see the performance. Let's see live metrics. How is this thing performing? I've got two CPUs on uh, customer service. I've got an API gateway. This is all going through the API gateway. One little API gateway. It's got like one CPU and two gigs of memory. Uh, let's see what's happening there. OK, cool. Uh, don't worry about that request failure rate there. That's, that just, when it starts up, it always uh, has that, though. But we can see that the request duration, uh, it was initially too high, but now it's, it's coming down there. So very performant there. Request rate that we get there, uh, dependency rate for the actual uh, databases here, the duration. Uh, don't worry about that. It, it just starts off there. It has to start off somewhere. Um, the CPU total. Uh, uh, the ex uh, exception rate. And then I can see there that my customer services here, I've got uh, a wolf, uh, two that are running because I auto scaled it uh, earlier today, uh, last 60 seconds. I've got, uh, uh, they're running onions, four CPU there. They're very performant, two gigs of RAM there. And I can even go into the role here. I can uh, go, let's go customer service. Oh, I see what those, that customer service is actually my deployment slot that I'm about to deploy there. So these are my backup services here. I've got two customer services in production. You can see there are five CPU and one. And the, the other ones, the other CPUs there, watch uh, when, when I do change that. Because I'm about to do live on air what no one would, uh, would, would uh, necessarily do. So I'm going to open up a, a, a new tab here. I'm going to leave that tab with those statistics. And now I'm going to do, uh, go and do a failover. So I'm going to go into uh, my Azure portal, leave that other uh, stats there. Now I'm going to take deployment slots. Now let's just say you want to do that. You end a heavy load, and you want to do a new app version here. So I'm going to go into my Spring uh, Cloud under the customer service here. And I've, under deployments, I've deployed the same app, though, but I want to show you how to do it with another two servers there. So I can go to deployments here. And uh, you'll see there I've got staging and production, uh, uh, two different versions here. So staging is out of service, production is up, and they've got two servers there. And that reflects to the, uh, let's close that there. Uh, that reflects to the servers here. I've got four servers. So two of them are uh, staging, and then the, the, you've got the other servers there. So let's fail over and see what happens. And we've, we've still got our million transactions really pummeling our, our customer service and, and the distributed transactions there also. So let's see what happens also when we do the distributed transactions. So now I'm going to go there. I'm going to go set as production. Are you ready? Set as production. Yes. Let's go back there, and let's just see. Are we going to fail over there? And let's see. Uh, uh, okay, let's. Nothing's failed over there, and uh, we've got twenty. Nothing you can see that's still tr transaction there, and uh, nothing there. We, oh, look! Did you see that? 
Uh, we've got the staging is taking some load, and it's it's actually um, Kubernetes is actually pushing load there uh, to one of the staging servers there. It's still pushing to um, some of those uh, production servers there, but we should actually see eventually the other staging server is going to come up there, and it will uh, uh, transfer the load completely over there. Let's go back to the – there we go, and done. I just Black friday and did a, 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 a deployment live on air with a million transactions. Now, can I go see those actual servers there and uh, what, uh, what happened there? So if I go into customer service and um, I can go into my distributed tracing and the application insights here, and I can go to the application map. I can see every transaction I just did there uh, in, in, in the last hour and end-to-end -end transaction management. Now, uh, uh, if, I, if I go into my customer service here, you see there's four instances because we've got four servers, two of the staging, two of the production. I can investigate the performance there. There's no failures there. You can see that. I can go investigate performance there, um, and then I can go through and see that we're still uh, request count really increased there. Uh, and the performance was great, was absolutely great. I didn't drop once with the performance there, even though that I did a deployment there. I had zero failures over there. Um, and also, if uh, you want to uh, put it in JavaScript, I've got another uh, great news for you. I actually did before, uh, earlier today, I went and uh, took the JavaScript the script, uh, SDK, and I put it in there for the application insights, and I can go and investigate the performance and see how long that page take, uh, took to load. So I can go there and see the page load. I can see that there's one sample there. I can drill down into that page load. I can see it's Chrome. I can see it's on a Mac OS there. And I can go in and go from the page all the way through to everything I've done there and end-to-end -end transaction management there. Uh, and that's the power of Azure Spring Cloud. I get, look at that. I get everything through that. I can see the user flows for my microservices. I can see the customer service came there. Uh, and uh, then I went through to um, the other services there, the vet service, the visit resource, uh, customer services, lots of customer services, obviously, because I'm pummeling it with a million transactions there. Um, and this is the, the front end. Remember, this isn't the, the service that I'm running in the background with the live metrics. This is actually me as a user. And you can see there, I've got Chrome. I'm coming from South Africa. And on average, uh, it took 2.7 seconds to do everything that I see there. So back to you, Martin. This is really an impressive demo that I want to show you. And I'm so glad that I actually did a failover uh, <laughs> in production. I'm going to stop those million transactions now. Awesome. The, the, demo, the demo deities were kind. Um, th that is really fantastic to see. Um, I, I remember in the old days when we used to have to you know, prepare for something like a Christmas Eve shopping event uh, when I used to work uh, back at, uh, uh, in New Zealand uh, for, uh, in a consultancy. You know, you'd have to try and plan in advance. H how many extra servers are we going to have to buy? Like, you know, can we rack mount them two weeks in advance? Can we get our software deployed, you know, mainly to each of these 20 extra servers? And can we get them all talking to each other in the same data center? Um, it was just awful. Uh, and there you've just shown at the click of a button, um, you know, this, this, this whole scale out and, and uh, failover scenario, which is just absolutely fantastic. Um, so yeah, if you're writing, uh, especially consumer facing applications uh, that are gonna have these kind of floods of users, or maybe you're just fronting a very popular blog, um, then, you know, something like Azure Spring Cloud could absolutely help. Uh, we have a whole pile of questions coming in. Um, so I'll just get straight into them and let's have a look on the first one here, which was actually a little bit off topic. I don't know if it has been answered further down, but someone is actually asking about the, the .NET uh, SpecFlow API tests, um, which is uh, for Java engineers who are listening to this. Uh, it's, it's kind of a Cucumber BDD, behavior-driven development style uh, test framework uh, that is utilized in .NET. Um, there is actually a distributed um, spec flow. Uh, you can go to GitHub and, oh, I've just lost the link, have I? Uh, let me go find the link again. Where did I put it? Um, yeah, if you just search for distributed hyphen spec flow, and spec flow is all one word, if you search for that on GitHub, there is a very popular project there, about 700 forks, I think, uh, which does exactly what, what, what you ask. Um, so it goes and distributes all the spec flow tests across different test servers. So uh, there you go. Told you we could answer anything. All right. Um, there's a question about what our favorite Windows 11 feature is under the hood. Now, Adam has kindly answered that from his perspective. Is there a particular Windows 11 feature that you've seen, Rory, that you like? 
Yeah, so I love the accessibility features. I'm a big accessibility advocate, and I speak on behalf of Microsoft. And as we progress through that, we, we're, we're incorporating AI into a lot of our features, into our Office Suite, into our Windows Suite. So yeah, the, 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 the screen reader features, the new features that are coming through there, everything with Edge, the integration, the tighter integration with Edge. Uh, you can use Application Insights to uh, check a lot of those features. So I'm a big, big, huge uh, fan of the Windows 11 accessibility features. Yeah, it's it's uh, yeah, really amazing point. I mean, one of the things about working at Microsoft is that you realize you you work on software that touches billions of people's lives, right? Uh, and that includes being inclusive and and thinking about the wide variety of humanity we, we have out there, which is fantastic. I know when I first joined Microsoft, you know, we went uh, you go through some accessibility training, and it's uh, it's it's heartwarming and heartbreaking at times uh, seeing seeing what some folks uh, you know what they have to struggle through to try and use uh, a user interface which has only been built for a certain cohort of humanity right and it's a real real eye opener in a, in a very good way um, next one i have here is there's a couple of questions around coding for gaming libraries and things um, in java so uh, we've post, post, posted a couple of links in the chat there obviously minecraft java edition very popular platform for java gaming uh, there is a lightweight Java gaming library um, uh, out there. So LWJGL uh, is what you can go search for. Uh, and that's kind of a popular engine that lots of game uh, Java game authors uh, use. Uh, what else do I have here? Do, 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 scrolling down. We had a Windows support question. Surprisingly enough, that's been answered in the chat. Aha, here we go. Question on profiling Spring Java service. Is there any Java profiler that can provide profile tracing heat maps of the Java code execution? So you're talking about an execution profiler? Um, so the answer is yes. You can either go for a third-party APM tool such as New Relic, AppDynamics, Dynatrace, and we support several of those in the Azure marketplace. Um, application Insights that Rory showed you before uh, is also going to be adding this feature. In fact, it's, uh, it's actually already, I think, enabled behind a feature flag uh, that you can get a Java flight recording, uh, which does execution profiling when you need it to, uh, to go and get that, that information. So that, that's, that's, all, that's all built in going forwards. Um, the next one we have is, ooh, how can I get an object ID that's tenanted Ooh, I mean, I this one I'm not too sure. Is there like further? Oh, this question's been split into two. This is a question around how can I get the object ID out when there's a I think when it's a multi-tenanted uh, transaction. Ooh, I'm not sure if I can answer that one live. I think we're gonna have to go send a, a link to application sites for some deep dive digging on that one. So perhaps uh, Adam or someone behind the scenes that we can find the link to the App Insights documentation. That's probably the best way to go for that one. Um, do, do, do some more questions, answers about that. All right, oh, very kind comment. Apparently we are Saints Rory, which is a very, very nice thing to say. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I believe that's all of the questions we have. So uh, once more from me, thank you so much for, for tuning in and spending a couple of hours with us uh, exploring modernizing your Java applications uh, with Microsoft on, on Azure. Uh, we hope you've had fun. Um, and uh, yeah, any last words from you, Rory? To the incredible UK team who has helped uh, set this out to have driven the, the social uh, um, uh, program to, to get it out there, um, to the user groups who are, are who are also part of this, um, to the London uh, Java community. Thank you so much for partaking of this. Um, and we're, we're, we're looking forward to engaging with the, uh, the, the UK Java community. And, and globally, Microsoft really empowers every developer in every organization. We go to where the developers are. So reach out to us on uh, Twitter. Um, my Twitter handle is uh, at Rory Pretty. <laughs> it's actually in my streaming profile. Um, and then uh, Martin, what is your Twitter handle? Uh, it's it's Cariana, which is quite strange. It's a very old handle, so but uh, you can see it see it there on on, on screen. Um, I, I also have the diabolical dev uh, handle, but that, that's a, an account which folks should not not follow because it gives only bad advice. <laughs> Um, yeah, so really follow the Java, Microsoft, myself, and uh, Martin. We, we really have so much to share, um, and uh, occasionally some nice anecdotes, uh, poking fun at uh, Bruno's YAML uh, lab. So yeah, <laughs> definitely come on by. But thank you, everyone, for uh, attending the session. Thank you to um, 
uh, Adam and Sarah and the team and the, everyone in the background there. And uh, yeah, uh, we look forward to really showing you that Java is a thriving, rich ecosystem at Microsoft. All right. Have a great week, everyone. Thank you.